This is Audible. Journey of Souls Case Studies of Life Between Lives by Michael Newton, Ph.D. Narrated by Peter Burkrot. First Edition Copyright, 1994. Fifth Revised Edition Copyright, 1996 by Michael Newton. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Llewellyn Worldwide Limited and was produced in the year 2011 by Tantor Media Incorporated, which holds the copyright there too. You would know the hidden realm where all souls dwell. The journey's way lies through death's misty fell. Within this timeless passage, a guiding light does dance, lost from conscious memory, but visible in trance. Michael Newton Introduction Are you afraid of death? Do you wonder what is going to happen to you after you die? Is it possible you have a spirit which came from somewhere else and will return there after your body dies? Or is this just wishful thinking because you are afraid? It is a paradox that humans, alone of all creatures of the earth, must repress the fear of death in order to lead normal lives. Yet our biological instinct never lets us forget this ultimate danger to our being. As we grow older, the specter of death rises in our consciousness. Even religious people fear death is the end of personhood. Our greatest dread of death brings thoughts about the nothingness of death, which will end all associations with family and friends. Dying makes all our earthly goals seem futile. If death were the end of everything about us, then life indeed would be meaningless. However, some power within us enables humans to conceive of a hereafter and to sense a connection to a higher power and even an eternal soul. If we do actually have a soul, then where does it go after death? Is there really some sort of heaven full of intelligent spirits outside our physical universe? What does it look like? What do we do when we get there? Is there a supreme being in charge of this paradise? These questions are as old as humankind itself, and still remain a mystery to most of us. The true answers to the mystery of life after death remain locked behind a spiritual door for most people. This is because we have built-in amnesia about our soul identity, which on a conscious level aids in the merging of the soul and human brain. In the last few years, the general public has heard about people who temporarily died and then came back to life to tell about seeing a long tunnel, bright lights, and even brief encounters with friendly spirits. But none of these accounts written in the many books on reincarnation has ever given us anything more than a glimpse of all there is to know about life after death. This book is an intimate journal about the spirit world. It provides a series of actual case histories which reveal in explicit detail what happens to us when life on earth is over. You will be taken beyond the spiritual tunnel and enter the spirit world itself to learn what transpires for souls before they finally return to earth in another life. I am a skeptic by nature, although it will not seem so from the contents of this book. As a counselor and hypnotherapist, I specialize in behavior modification for the treatment of psychological disorders. A large part of my work involves short-term cognitive restructuring with clients by helping them connect thoughts and emotions to promote healthy behavior. Together we elicit the meaning, function, and consequences of their beliefs, because I take the premise that no mental problem is imaginary. In the early days of my practice, I resisted past life requests from people because of my orientation toward traditional therapy. While I used hypnosis and age regression techniques to determine the origins of disturbing memories and childhood trauma, I felt any attempt to reach a former life was unorthodox and non-clinical. My interest in reincarnation and metaphysics was only intellectual curiosity until I worked with a young man on pain management. This client complained of a lifetime of chronic pain on his right side. 
One of the tools of hypnotherapy to manage pain is directing the subject to make the pain worse, so he or she can also learn to lessen the aching and thus acquire control. In one of our sessions involving pain intensification, this man used the imagery of being stabbed to recreate his torment. Searching for the origins of this image, I eventually uncovered his former life as a World War I soldier who was killed by a bayonet in France, and we were able to eliminate the pain altogether. With encouragement from some of my clients, I began to experiment with moving some of them further back in time, before their last birth on Earth. Initially, I was concerned that a subject's integration of current needs, beliefs, and fears would create fantasies of recollection. However, it didn't take long before I realized our deep-seated memories offer a set of past experiences which are too real and connected to be ignored. I came to appreciate just how therapeutically important the link is between the bodies and events of our former lives and who we are today. Then I stumbled onto a discovery of enormous proportions. I found it was possible to see into the spirit world through the mind's eye of a hypnotized subject who could report back to me of life between lives on earth. The case that opened the door to the spirit world for me was a middle-aged woman who was an especially receptive hypnosis subject. She had been talking to me about her feelings of loneliness and isolation in that delicate stage when a subject has finished recalling their most recent past life. This unusual individual slipped into the highest state of altered consciousness almost by herself. Without realizing I had initiated an overly short command for this action, I suggested she go to the source of her loss of companionship. At the same moment, I inadvertently used one of the trigger words to spiritual recall. I also asked if she had a specific group of friends whom she missed. Suddenly, my client started to cry. When I directed her to tell me what was wrong, she blurted out, I miss some friends in my group, and that's why I get so lonely on earth. I was confused, and questioned her further about where this group of friends was actually located. Here, in my permanent home she answered simply, and I'm looking at all of them right now. After finishing with this client and reviewing her tape recordings, I recognized that finding the spirit world involves an extension of past life regression. There are many books about past lives, but none I could find which told about our lives as souls, or how to properly access the spiritual recollections of people. I decided to do the research myself, and with practice, I acquired greater skill in entering the spirit world through my subjects. I also learned that finding their place in the spirit world was far more meaningful to people than recounting their former lives on earth. How is it possible to reach the soul through hypnosis? Visualize the mind as having three concentric circles, each smaller than the last and within the other, separated only by layers of connected mind consciousness. The first outer layer is represented by the conscious mind, which is our critical analytic reasoning source. The second layer is the subconscious, where we initially go in hypnosis to tap into the storage area for all the memories that ever happened to us in this life and former lives. The third, the innermost core, is what we are now calling the superconscious mind. This level exposes the highest center of self, where we are an expression of a higher power. The superconscious houses our real identity, augmented by the subconscious, which contains the memories of the many alter egos assumed by us in our former human bodies. The superconscious may not be a level at all, but the soul itself. The superconscious mind represents our highest center of wisdom and perspective, and all my information about life after death comes from this source of intelligent energy. How valid is the use of hypnosis for uncovering truth? People in hypnosis are neither dreaming nor hallucinating. We don't dream in chronological sequences, nor hallucinate in a directed trance state. When subjects are placed in trance, their brainwaves slow from the beta wake state 
and continue to change vibration down past the meditative alpha stage into various levels within the theta range. Theta is hypnosis, not sleep. When we sleep, we go to the final delta state, where messages from the brain are dropped into the subconscious and vented through our dreams. In theta, however, the conscious mind is not unconscious, so we are able to receive as well as send messages with all memory channels open. Once in hypnosis, people report the pictures they see and dialogue they hear in their unconscious minds as literal observations. In response to questions, subjects cannot lie, but they may misinterpret something seen in their unconscious mind, just as we do in the conscious state. In hypnosis, people have trouble relating to anything they don't believe is the truth. Some critics of hypnosis believe a subject in trance will fabricate memories and bias their responses in order to adopt any theoretical framework suggested by the hypnotist. I find this generalization to be a false premise. In my work, I treat each case as if I were hearing the information for the first time. If a subject were somehow able to overcome hypnosis procedure and construct a deliberate fantasy about the spirit world, or free associate from preset ideas about their afterlife, these responses would soon become inconsistent with my other case reports. I learned the value of careful cross-examination early in my work, and I found no evidence of anyone faking their spiritual experiences to please me. In fact, subjects in hypnosis are not hesitant in correcting my misinterpretations of their statements. As my case files grew, I discovered by trial and error to phrase questions about the spirit world in a proper sequence. Subjects in a superconscious state are not particularly motivated to volunteer information about the whole plan of soul life in the spirit world. One must have the right set of keys for specific doors. Eventually, I was able to perfect a reliable method of memory access to different parts of the spirit world by knowing which door to open at the right time during a session. As I gained confidence with each session, more people sensed I was comfortable with the hereafter and felt it was all right to speak to me about it. The clients in my cases represent some men and women who were very religious, while others had no particular spiritual beliefs at all. Most fall somewhere in between, with a mixed bag of personal philosophies about life. The astounding thing I found as I progressed with my research was that once subjects were regressed back into their soul state, they all displayed a remarkable consistency in responding to questions about the spirit world. People even used the same words and graphic descriptions in colloquial language when discussing their lives as souls. However, this homogeneity of experience by so many clients did not stop me from continually trying to verify statements between my subjects and corroborate specific functional activities of souls. There were some differences in narrative reporting between cases, but this was due more to the level of soul development than to variances in how each subject basically saw the spirit world. The research was painfully slow, but as the body of my cases grew, I finally had a working model of the eternal world where our souls live. I found thoughts about the spirit world would involve universal truths among the souls of people living on earth. It was these perceptions by so many different types of people which convinced me their statements were believable. I am not a religious person, but I found the place where we go after death to be one of order and direction, and I have come to appreciate that there is a grand design to life and afterlife. When I considered how best to present my findings, I determined the case study method would provide the most descriptive way in which the reader could evaluate client recall about the afterlife. Each case I have selected represents a direct dialogue between myself and the subject. The case testimonies are taken from tape recordings from my sessions. This book is not intended to be about my subject's past lives, but rather a documentation of their experiences in the spirit world relating to those lives. For readers who may have trouble conceptualizing our souls as non-material objects, the case histories listed in the early chapters explain how souls appear and the way in which they function. Each case history is abbreviated to some extent because of space constraints, 
and to give the reader an orderly arrangement of soul activity. The chapters are designed to show the normal progression of souls into and out of the spirit world, incorporated with other spiritual information. The travels of souls from the time of death to their next incarnation has come to me from over thirty years of life between lives hypnotherapy. The travels of souls from the time of death to their next incarnation has engaged my studies since the 1970s, growing with each decade. However, most of the LBL cases in this book were collected within the past ten years. It surprised me at first that I had people who remembered parts of their soul life more clearly after distant lifetimes than recent ones. Yet, for some reason, no one subject was able to recall the entire chronology of soul activities I have presented in this book. My clients remember certain aspects of their spiritual life quite vividly, while others' experiences are hazy to them. As a result, even with these 29 cases, I found I could not give the reader the full range of information I have gathered about the spirit world. Thus, my chapters contain details from more cases than just the 29 listed. The reader may consider my questioning in certain cases to be rather demanding. In hypnosis, it is necessary to keep the subject on track. When working in the spiritual realm, the demands on a facilitator are higher than with past life recall. In trance, the average subject tends to let his or her soul mind wander while watching interesting scenes unfold. My clients often want me to stop talking so they can detach from reporting what they see and just enjoy their past experiences as souls. I try to be gentle and not overly structured, but my sessions are usually single ones, which run three hours in length, and there is a lot to cover. People may come long distances to see me and not be able to return. I find it very rewarding to watch the look of wonder on a client's face when his or her session ends. For those of us who have had the opportunity to actually see our immortality, a new depth of self-understanding and empowerment emerges. Before awakening my subjects, I often implant appropriate post-suggestion memories. Having a conscious knowledge of their soul life in the spirit world and a history of physical existences on planets gives these people a stronger sense of direction and energy for life. Finally, I should say that what you are about to read may come as a shock to your preconceptions about death. The material presented here may go against your philosophical and religious beliefs. There will be those readers who will find support for their existing opinions. For others, the information offered in these cases will all appear to be subjective tales, resembling a science fiction story. Whatever your persuasion, I hope you will reflect upon the implications for humanity, if what my subjects have to say about life after death is accurate. One. Death and Departure Case 1 Subject Oh my God! I'm not really dead, am I? I mean, my body is dead. I can see it below me, but I'm floating. I can look down and see my body lying flat in the hospital bed. Everyone around me thinks I'm dead, but I'm not. I want to shout, Hey, I'm not really dead! This is so incredible. The nurses are pulling a sheet over my head. People I know are crying. I'm supposed to be dead, but I'm still alive. It's strange, because my body is absolutely dead while I'm moving around it from above. I'm alive. These are the words spoken by a man in deep hypnosis, reliving a death experience. His words come in short, excited bursts and are full of awe as he sees and feels what it is to be like to be a spirit newly separated from a physical body. This man is my client, and I have just assisted him in recreating a past life death scene, while he lies back in a comfortable recliner chair. A little earlier, following my instructions during his trance induction, this subject was age-regressed in a return to childhood memories. His subconscious perceptions gradually coalesced as we worked together to reach his mother's womb. I then prepared him for a jump back into the mists of time by the visual use of protective shielding. When we completed this important step of mental conditioning, 
I moved my subject through an imaginary time tunnel to his last life on Earth. It was a short life, because he had died suddenly from the influenza epidemic of 1918. As the initial shock of seeing himself die and feeling his soul floating out of his body begins to wear off a little, my client adjusts more readily to the visual images in his mind. Since a small part of the conscious critical portion of his mind is still functioning, he realizes he is recreating a former experience. It takes a bit longer than usual, since this subject is a younger soul, and not so used to the cycles of birth, death, and rebirth, as are many of my other clients. Yet, within a few moments, he settles in and begins to respond with greater confidence to my questions. I quickly raise this subject's subconscious hypnotic level into the superconscious state. Now he is ready to talk to me about the spirit world, and I ask him what is happening to him. Subject Well, I'm rising up higher, still floating, looking back at my body. It's like watching a movie, only I'm in it. The doctor is comforting my wife and daughter. My wife is sobbing. Subject wiggles with discomfort in his chair. I'm trying to reach into her mind, to tell her everything is all right with me. She is so overcome by grief, I'm not getting through. I want her to know my suffering is gone. I'm free of my body. I don't need it anymore, that I will wait for her. I want her to know that, but she is not listening to me. Oh, I'm moving away now. And so, guided by a series of commands, my client starts the process of moving further into the spirit world. It is a road many others have traveled in the security of my office. Typically, as memories in the superconscious state expand, subjects in hypnosis become more connected to the spiritual passageway. As the session moves forward, the subject's mental pictures are more easily translated into words. Short, descriptive phrases lead to detailed explanations of what it is like to enter the spirit world. We have a great deal of documentation, including observations from medical personnel, which describes the out-of-body near-death experiences of people severely injured in accidents. These people were considered clinically dead before medical efforts brought them back from the other side. Souls are quite capable of leaving and returning to their host bodies, particularly in life-threatening situations when the body is dying. People tell of hovering over their bodies, especially in hospitals, watching doctors perform life-saving procedures on them. In time, these memories fade after they return to life. In the early stages of hypnosis regression into past lives, the descriptions of subjects mentally going through their past deaths do not contradict the reported statements of people who have actually died in this life for a few minutes. The difference between these two groups of people is that subjects in hypnosis are not remembering their experiences of temporary death. People in a deep trance state are capable of describing what life is like after permanent physical death. What are the similarities of afterlife recollection between people reporting on their out-of-body experiences as a result of a temporary physical trauma and a subject in hypnosis recalling death in a past life? Both find themselves floating around their bodies in a strange way, trying to touch solid objects which dematerialize in front of them. Both kinds of reporters say they are frustrated in their attempts to talk to living people who don't respond. Both state they feel a pulling sensation away from the place where they died, and experience relaxation and curiosity rather than fear. All these people report a euphoric sense of freedom and brightness around them. Some of my subjects see brilliant whiteness totally surrounding them at the moment of death, while others observe the brightness as farther away from an area of darker space through which they are being pulled. This is often referred to as the tunnel effect, and has become well known with the public. My second case will take us further into the death experience than case one. The subject here is a man in his sixties describing to me the events of his death 
as a young woman called Sally, who was killed by Kiowa Indians in an attack on a wagon train in 1866. Although this case and the last one relate death experiences after their most immediate past lives, a particular death date in history has no special relevance because it is recent. I find no significant differences between ancient and modern times in terms of graphic spirit world recall or the quality of lessons learned. I should also say the average subject in trance has an uncanny ability to zero in on the dates and geographic locations of many past lives. This is true even in earlier periods of human civilization, when national borders and place names were different than exist today. Former names, dates, and locations may not always be easily recalled in every past life, but descriptions about returning to the spirit world and life in that world are consistently vivid. The scene in Case 2 opens on the American Southern Plains right after an arrow has struck Sally in the neck at close range. I am always careful with death scenes involving violent trauma in past lives, because the subconscious mind often still retains these experiences. The subject in this case came to me because of a lifetime of throat discomfort. Release therapy and deprogramming is usually required in these cases. In all past life recall, I use the time around death for quiet review and place the subject in observer status to soften pain and emotion. Case 2 Dr. N. Are you in great pain from the arrow? Subject. Yes. The point has torn my throat. I'm dying. Subject begins to whisper while holding his hands at the throat. I'm choking. Blood pouring down. Will, husband, is holding me. The pain. Terrible. I'm getting out now. It's over anyway. Note. Souls often leave their human hosts moments before actual death, when their bodies are in great pain. Who can blame them? Nevertheless, they do stay close by the dying body. After calming techniques, I raise this subject from the subconscious to the superconscious level for the transition to spiritual memories. Dr. N. All right, Sally. You have accepted being killed by these Indians. Will you please describe to me the exact sensation you feel at the time of death? Subject. Like a force of some kind, pushing me up out of my body. Dr. N. Pushing you out where? Subject. I'm ejected out the top of my head. Dr. N. And what was pushed out? Subject. Well, me. Dr. N. Describe what me means. What does the thing that is you look like going out of the head of your body? Subject. Pause. Like a pinpoint of light radiating. Dr. N. How do you radiate light? Subject. From my energy. I look sort of transparent white. My soul. Dr. N. And does this energy light stay the same after leaving your body? Subject. Pause. I seem to grow a little as I move around. Dr. N. If your light expands, then what do you look like now? Subject. Uh, wispy... String, hanging. Dr. N. And what does the process of moving out of your body actually feel like to you? Subject. Well, it's as if I shed my skin. Peeling a banana. I just lose my body in one swoosh. Dr. N. Is the feeling unpleasant? Subject. Oh, no. It's wonderful to feel so free with no more pain, but I am disoriented. I didn't expect to die. 
Sadness is creeping into my client's voice, and I want him to stay focused on his soul for a minute more, rather than what is taking place on the ground with his body. Dr. N. I understand, Sally. You are feeling a little displacement at the moment as a soul. This is normal in your situation for what you have just gone through. Listen and respond to my questions. You said you were floating. Are you able to move around freely right after death? Subject. It's strange. It's as if I'm suspended in air that isn't air. There are no limits. No gravity. I'm weightless. Dr. N., you mean it's sort of like being in a vacuum for you? Subject. Yes, nothing around me is a solid mass. There are no obstacles to bump into? I'm drifting. Dr. N., can you control your movements? Where are you going? Subject. Yes, I can do some of that, but there is a pulling into a bright whiteness. It's so bright. Dr. N. Is the intensity of whiteness the same everywhere? Subject. Brighter away from me. It's a little darker white, gray, in the direction of my body. Starts to cry. Oh, my poor body. I'm not ready to leave yet. Subject pulls back in his chair as if he is resisting something. Dr. N. It's all right, Sally. I'm with you. I want you to relax and tell me if the force that took you out of your head at the moment of death is still pulling you away, and if you can stop it. Subject. Pause. When I was free of my body, the pulling lessened. Now I feel a nudge, drawing me away from my body. I don't want to go yet, but something wants me to go soon. Dr. N. I understand, Sally, but I suspect you are learning that you have some element of control. How would you describe this thing that is pulling you? Subject. A kind of magnetic force, but I want to stay a little longer. Dr. N. Can your soul resist this pulling sensation for as long as you want? Subject. There is a long pause while the subject appears to be carrying on an internal debate with himself in his former life as Sally. Yes, I can if I really want to stay. Subject starts to cry. Oh, it's awful what those savages did to my body. There is blood all over my pretty blue dress. My husband Will is trying to hold me and still fight with our friends against the Kiowa. Note. I reinforce the imagery of a protective shield around this subject, which is so important as a foundation to calming procedures. Sally's soul is still hovering over her body after I move the scene forward in time to when the Indians are driven off by the wagon train rifles. Dr. N. Sally, what is your husband doing right after the attack? Subject. Oh, good. He isn't hurt, but... With sadness. He is holding my body, crying over me. There is nothing he can do for me, but he doesn't seem to realize that yet. I'm cold, but his hands are around my face, kissing me. Dr. N. And what are you doing at this moment? Subject. I'm over Will's head. I'm trying to console him. I want him to feel my love is not really gone. I want him to know that he has not lost me forever and that I will see him again. Dr. N. Are your messages getting through? Subject. There is so much grief, but he feels my essence. I know it. Our friends are around him, and they separate us finally. They want to reform the wagons and get started again. Dr. N. And what is going on now with your soul? Subject. I'm still resisting the pulling sensation. I want to stay. Dr. N. Why is that? Subject. 
Well, I know I'm dead, but I'm not ready to leave Will yet, and I want to watch them bury me. Dr. N. Do you see or feel any other spiritual entity around you at this moment? Subject. Pause. They are near. Soon I will see them. I feel their love as I want Will to feel mine. They are waiting until I am ready. Dr. N. As time passes, are you able to comfort Will? Subject. I'm trying to reach inside his mind. Dr. N. And are you successful? Subject. Pause. I think a little. He feels me. He realizes. Love. Dr. N. All right, Sally. Now we are going to move forward in relative time again. Do you see your wagon train friends placing your body in some kind of grave? Subject. Voice is more confident. Yes, they have buried me. It's time for me to go. They are coming for me now. I'm moving into a brighter light. Contrary to what some people believe, souls often have little interest in what happens to their bodies once they are physically dead. This is not callousness over personal situations and the people they leave behind on earth, but an acknowledgment of these souls to the finality of mortal death. They have a desire to hurry on their way to the beauty of the spirit world. However, many other souls want to hover around the place where they died for a few earth days, usually until after their funerals. Time is apparently accelerated for souls, and days on earth may be only minutes to them. There are a variety of motivations for the lingering soul. For instance, someone who has been murdered or killed unexpectedly in an accident often does not want to leave right away. I find these souls are frequently bewildered or angry. The hovering soul syndrome is particularly true of deaths with young people. To abruptly detach from a human form, even after a long illness, is still a jolt to the average soul, and this too may make the soul reluctant to depart at the moment of death. There is also something symbolic about the normal three- to five-day funeral arrangement periods for souls. Souls really have no morbid curiosity to see themselves buried, because emotions in the spirit world are not the same as we experience here on Earth. Yet I find soul entities appreciate the respect given to the memory of their physical life by surviving relatives and friends. As we saw in the last case, there is one basic reason for many spirits not wanting to immediately leave the place of their physical death. This comes from a desire to mentally reach out, to comfort loved ones before progressing further into the spirit world. Those who have just died are not devastated about their death, because they know those left on earth will see them again in the spirit world, and probably later in other lives as well. On the other hand, Mourners at a funeral generally feel they have lost a loved one forever. During hypnosis, my subjects do recall frustration at being unable to effectively use their energy to mentally touch a human being who is unreceptive due to shock and grief. Emotional trauma of the living may overwhelm their inner minds to such an extent that their mental capabilities to communicate with souls are inhibited. When a newly departed soul does find a way to give solace to the living, however briefly, they usually are satisfied and want to then move on quickly away from Earth's astral plane. I had a typical example of spiritual consolation in my own life. My mother died suddenly from a heart attack. During her burial service, my sister and I were so filled with sadness our minds were numb at the ceremony. A few hours later, we returned to my mother's empty house with our spouses and decided to take a needed rest. My sister and I must have reached the receptive alpha state at about the same time. Appearing in two separate rooms, my mother came through our subconscious minds as a dreamlike brush of whiteness above our heads. Reaching out, she smiled, indicating her acceptance of death and current well-being. Then she floated away. Lasting only seconds, this act was a meaningful form of closure, 
causing both of us to release into a sound sleep of the Delta State. We are capable of feeling the comforting presence of the souls of lost loved ones, especially during or right after funerals. For spiritual communication to come through the shock of mourning, it is necessary to try to relax and clear your mind, at least for short periods. At these moments, our receptivity to a paranormal experience is more open to receive positive communications of love, forgiveness, hope, encouragement, and the reassurance your loved one is in a good place. When a widow with young children says to me, A part of my husband comes to me during the difficult times, I believe her. My clients tell me as souls they are able to help those on earth connect their inner minds to the spirit world itself. As it has been wisely said, people are not really gone as long as they are remembered by those left on earth. In the chapters ahead, we will see how specific memory is a reflection of our own soul, while collective memories are the atoms of pure energy for all souls. Death does not break our continuity with the immortal soul of those we love, simply because they have lost the physical personhood of a mortal body. Despite their many activities, these departed souls are still able to reach us if called upon. Occasionally, a disturbed spirit does not want to leave the earth after physical death. This is due to some unresolved problem which has had a severe impact on its consciousness. In these abnormal cases, help is available from higher caring entities who can assist in the adjustment process from the other side. We also have the means to aid disturbed spirits in letting go on earth as well. I will have more to say about troubled souls in chapter 4, but the enigma of ghosts portrayed in books and movies has been greatly overblown. How should we best prepare for our own death? Our lives may be short or long, healthy or sick, but there comes that time when we all must meet death in a way suited for us. If we have had a long illness leading to death, there is time to adequately prepare the mind once initial shock denial, and depression are fast. The mind takes a shortcut through this sort of progression when we face death suddenly. As the end of our physical life draws near, each of us has the capacity to fuse with our higher consciousness. Dying is the easiest period in our lives for spiritual awareness, when we can sense our soul is connected to the eternity of time. Although there are dying people who find acceptance to be more difficult than resignation, caregivers working around the dying say most everyone acquires a peaceful detachment near the end. I believe dying people are given access to a supreme knowledge of eternal consciousness, and this frequently shows in their faces. Many of these people realize something universal is out there waiting, and it will be good. Dying people are undergoing a metamorphosis of separation by their souls from an adopted body. People associate death as losing our life force, when actually the opposite is true. We forfeit our body in death, but our eternal life energy unites with the force of a divine oversoul. Death is not darkness, but light. My clients say, after recalling former death experiences, they are so filled with rediscovered freedom from their earthbound bodies that they are anxious to get started on their spiritual journey to a place of peace and familiarity. In the cases which follow, we will learn what life is like for them in afterlife. 2. Gateway to the Spirit World For thousands of years, the people of Mesopotamia believed the gates into and out of heaven lay at opposite ends of the great curve of the Milky Way, called the River of Souls. After death, souls had to wait for the rising doorway of Sagittarius and the autumn equinox, when day and night are equal. Reincarnation back to Earth could only take place during the spring equinox through the Gemini exit in their night sky. My subjects tell me that soul migration is actually much easier. The tunnel effect they experience when leaving Earth is the portal into the spirit world. Although souls leave their bodies swiftly, it seems to me entry into the spirit world is a carefully measured process. Later, 
When we return to Earth in another life, the route back is described as being more rapid. The location of the tunnel in relation to the Earth has some variations between the accounts of my subjects. Some newly dead people see it opening up next to them right over their bodies, while others say they move high above the Earth before they enter the tunnel. In all cases, however, the time lapse in reaching this passageway is negligible once the soul leaves Earth. Here are the observations of another individual in this spiritual location. Case 3 Dr. N You are now leaving your body. See yourself moving further and further away from the place where you died, away from the plane of Earth. Report back to me what you are experiencing. Subject At first, it was very bright, close to the Earth. Now it's a little darker because I have gone into a tunnel. Dr. N, describe this tunnel for me. Subject It's a hollow, dim vent and there is a small circle of light at the other end. Dr. N. Okay, what happens to you next? Subject. I feel a tugging, a gentle pulling. I think I'm supposed to drift through this tunnel, and I do. It is more gray than dark now, because the bright circle is expanding in front of me. It's as if... Client stops. Dr. N. Go on. Subject. I'm being summoned forward. Dr. N. Let the circle of light expand in front of you at the end of the tunnel and continue to explain what is happening to you. Subject. The circle of light grows very wide and... I'm out of the tunnel. There's a cloudy brightness, a light fog. I'm filtering through it. Dr. N. As you leave the tunnel, what else stands out in your mind, besides the lack of absolute visual clarity? Subject. Subject lowers voice. It's so... still. It is such a quiet place to be in. I am in the place of the spirits. Dr. N. Do you have any other impressions at this moment as a soul? Subject. Thought. I feel the... Power of thought all around me, I... Dr. N. Just relax completely and let your impressions come through easily as you continue to report back to me exactly what is happening to you. Please go on. Subject. Well, it's hard to put into words. I feel... Thoughts of love. Companionship. Empathy. And it's all combined with... Anticipation, as if others are waiting for me. Dr. N. Do you have a sense of security, or are you a little scared? Subject. I'm not scared. When I was in the tunnel, I was more disoriented. Yes, I feel secure. I'm aware of thoughts reaching out to me, of caring, nurturing. It is strange, but there is also the understanding around me of just who I am and why I am here now. Dr. N., do you see any evidence of this around you? Subject, in a hushed tone. No, I sense it. A harmony of thought everywhere. Dr. N., you mentioned cloud-like substances around you right after leaving the tunnel. Are you in a sky over Earth? Subject, pause. No, not that. But I seem to be floating through cloud stuff, which is different from Earth. Dr. N., can you see the Earth at all? Is it below you? Subject. Maybe it is, but I haven't seen it since I went in the tunnel. Dr. N., do you sense you are still connected to Earth through another dimension, perhaps? Subject. That's a possibility, yes. In my mind, Earth seems close and I still feel connected to Earth, but I know I'm in another space. Dr. N. What can you tell me about your present location? Subject. It's still a little murky, but I'm moving out of this. 
This particular subject, having been taken through the death experience and the tunnel, continues to make tranquil mental adjustments to her bodiless state while pulling further into the spirit world. After some initial uncertainty, her first reported impressions reflect an inviting sense of well-being. This is a common feeling among my subjects. Once through the tunnel, our souls have passed the initial gateway of their journey into the spirit world. Most now fully realize they are not really dead, but have simply left the encumbrance of an earth body which has died. With this awareness comes acceptance in varying degrees, depending upon the soul. Some subjects look at these surroundings with continued amazement, while others are more matter-of-fact in reporting to me what they see. Much depends upon their respective maturity and recent life experiences. The most common type of reaction I hear is a relieved sigh followed by something on the order of, Oh, wonderful, I'm home in this beautiful place again. There are those highly developed souls who move so fast out of their bodies that much of what I am describing here is a blur as they home into their spiritual destinations. These are the pros, and in my opinion they are a distinct minority on earth. The average soul does not move that rapidly, and some are very hesitant. If we exclude the rare cases of highly disturbed spirits who fight to stay connected with their dead bodies, I find it is the younger souls with fewer past lives who remain attached to Earth's environment right after death. Most of my subjects report that as they emerge from the mouth of the tunnel, things are still unclear for a while. I think this is due to the density of the nearest astral plane surrounding Earth, called the Kamaloka by theosophists. The next case describes this area from the perspective of a more analytical client. The soul of this individual demonstrates considerable observational insight into form, colors, and vibrational levels. Normally, such graphic physical descriptions by my subjects occur deeper into the spirit world after they get used to their surroundings. Case 4 Dr. N. As you move further away from the tunnel, describe what you see around you in as much detail as possible. Subject. Things are layered. Dr. N. Layered in what way? Subject. Um, sort of like a cake. Dr. N. Using a cake as a model, explain what you mean. Subject. I mean some cakes have small tops and are wide at the bottom. It's not like that when I get through the tunnel. I see layers, levels of light. They appear to me to be translucent, indented. Dr. N. Do you see the spirit world here is made up of a solid structure? Subject. That's what I'm trying to explain. It's not solid, although you might think so at first. It's layered. The levels of light are all woven together in stratified threads. I don't want to make it sound like things are not symmetrical. They are. But I see variations in thickness and color refraction in the layers. They also shift back and forth. I always notice this as I travel away from Earth. Dr. N. Why do you think this is so? Subject. I don't know. I didn't design it. Dr. N. From your description, I picture the spirit world as a huge tier with layers of shaded sections, from top to bottom. Subject. Yes, and the sections are rounded. They curve away from me as I float through them. Dr. N. From your position of observation, can you tell me about the different colors of the layers? Subject. I didn't say the layers had any major color tones. They are all variations of white. It is lighter, brighter where I'm going than where I have been. Around me now is a hazy whiteness which was much brighter than the tunnel. Dr. N. As you float through these spiritual layers, is your soul moving up or down? Subject. Neither I am moving across. Dr. N. Well then, do you see the spirit world at this moment in linear dimensions of lines and angles as you move across? Subject. 
pause. For me, it is mostly sweeping, non-material energy, which is broken into layers by light and dark color variations. I think something is pulling me into my proper level of travel and trying to relax me, too. Dr. N., in what way? Subject. I'm hearing sounds. Dr. N., what sounds? Subject. An echo of music. <laughs> Musical tingling. Wind chimes. Vibrating with my movements. So relaxing. Dr. N., other people have defined these sounds as vibrational in nature, similar to riding on the resonance from the twang of a tuning fork. Do you agree or disagree with this description? Subject nods in assent. Yes, that's what this is. And I have a memory of scent and taste, too. Dr. N., does this mean our physical senses stay with us after death? Subject, yes, the memory of them. The waves of musical notes here are so beautiful. Bells, strings, such tranquility. Many spirit world travelers report back to me about the relaxing sensations of musical vibrations. Noise sensations start quite early after death. Some subjects tell me they hear humming or buzzing sounds right after leaving their physical bodies. This is similar to the noise one hears standing near telephone wires, and may vary in volume before souls pull away from what I believe to be the Earth's astral plane. People have said they hear these same sounds when under general anesthesia. These flat, ringing sounds become more musical when we leave the tunnel. This music has been appropriately called energy of the universe because it revitalizes the soul. With subjects who speak about spiritual layering, I mentioned the possibility that they could be seeing astral planes. In metaphysical writing, we read a lot about planes above the earth. Beginning with ancient Indian scriptures called the Vedas, followed by later Eastern texts, astral planes have historically represented a series of rising dimensions above the physical or tangible world, which blend into the spiritual. These invisible regions have been experienced by people over thousands of years through meditative, out-of-body observations of the mind. Astral planes also have been described as being less dense as one moves farther away from the heavy influences of Earth. The next case represents a soul who is still troubled after passing through the spiritual tunnel. This is a man who, at age 36, died of a heart attack on a Chicago street in 1902. He left behind a large family of young children and a wife who was deeply loved. They were very poor. Case 5 Dr. N. Can you see clearly yet as you travel beyond the tunnel? Subject I'm still passing through these foamy clouds around me. Dr. N. I want you to move all the way through this and tell me what you see now. Subject Pause. Oh, I'm out of it. My God, this place is big. It's so bright and clean it even smells good. I am looking at a beautiful ice palace. Dr. N., tell me more. Subject, with amazement. It's enormous. It looks like bright, sparkling crystal. Colored stones shining all around me. Dr. N., when you say crystalline, I think of a clear color. Subject. Well, there are mostly grays and white, but as I float along, I do see other colors. Mosaics, all glittery. Dr. N. Look into the distance from within this ice palace. Do you see any boundaries anywhere? Subject. No. This place is infinite, so majestic, and peaceful. Dr. N., what are you feeling right now? Subject, I can't fully enjoy it. I don't want to go further. Maggie, subject's widow. Dr. N., I can see you are still disturbed about the Chicago life, 
But does this inhibit your progress into the spirit world? Subject. Subject jerks upright in my office chair. Good. I see my guide coming towards me. She knows what I need. Dr. N. Tell me what transpires between you and your guide. Subject. I say to her I can't go on. That I need to know Maggie and the children are going to be okay. Dr. N. And how does your guide respond? Subject. She is comforting me. But I'm too loaded down. Dr. N. What do you say to her? Subject. Shouting. I tell her, why did you allow this to happen? How could you do this to me? You made me go through such pain and hardship with Maggie, and now you cut off our life together. Dr. N. What does your guide do? Subject. She is trying to soothe me, telling me I did a good job, and that I will see my life ran its intended course. Dr. N. Do you accept what she says? Subject. Pause. In my mind, information comes to me of the future on earth, that the family is getting on without me, accepting that I am gone. They are going to make it, and we will all see each other again. Dr. N. And how does this make you feel? Subject. I feel peace. With a sigh. I am ready to go on now. Before touching on the significance of Case 5 meeting his guide here, I want to mention this man's interpretation of the spirit world appearing as an ice palace. Further into the spirit world, my subjects will talk about seeing buildings and being in furnished rooms. The state of hypnosis by itself does not create these images. Logically, people should not be recalling such physical structures in a non-material world, unless we consider these scenes of Earth's natural environment are intended to aid in the soul's transition and adjustment from a physical death. These sites have individual meaning for every soul communicating with me, all of whom are affected by their Earth experiences. When the soul sees images in the spirit world which relate to places they have lived or visited on Earth, there is a reason. An unforgotten home, school, garden, mountain, or seashore are seen by souls because a benevolent spiritual force allows for terrestrial mirages to comfort us by their familiarity. Our planetary memories never die. They whisper forever into the soul mind, on the winds of mythical dreams, just as images of the spirit world do so within the human mind. I enjoy hearing from subjects about their first images of the spirit world. People may see fields of wildflowers, castle towers rising in the distance, or rainbows under an open sky when returning to this place of adoration after an absence. These first ethereal earth scenes of the spirit world don't seem to change a great deal over a span of lives for the returning soul, although there is variety between client descriptions. I find that once a subject in trance continues further into the spirit world to describe the functional aspects of spiritual life, their comments become more uniform. The case I have just reviewed could be described as a fairly unsettled spirit bonded closely to his soulmate, Maggie, who was left behind. There is no question that some souls do carry the negative baggage of a difficult past life longer than others, despite the calming influences of the spirit world. People tend to think all souls become omniscient at death. This is not completely true, because adjustment periods vary. The time of soul adjustment depends upon the circumstances of death, attachments of each soul to the memories of the life just ended, and level of advancement. I frequently hear anger during age regression, when a young life ends suddenly. Souls re-entering the spirit world under these conditions are often bewildered and confused over leaving people they love without much warning. They are unprepared for death and some feel sad and deprived right after leaving their bodies. If a soul has been traumatized by unfinished business, usually the first entity it sees right after death is its guide. These highly developed spiritual teachers are prepared to take the initial brunt of a soul's frustration following an untimely death. Case 5 will eventually make a healthy adjustment to the spirit world, 
by allowing his guide to assist him during the balance of his incoming trip. However, I have found our guides do not encourage the complete working out of thought disorders at the spiritual gateway. There are more appropriate times and places for detailed reviews about karmic learning lessons involving life and death, which I will describe later. The guide in Case 5 offered a brief visualization of accelerated earth time as a means of soothing this man about the future of his wife and children, so he could continue on his journey with more acceptance. Regardless of their state of mind right after death, my subjects are full of exclamations about rediscovered marvels of the spirit world. Usually, this feeling is combined with euphoria, that all their worldly cares have been left behind, especially physical pain. Above all else, the spirit world represents a place of supreme quiescence to the traveling soul. Although it may at first appear we are alone immediately following death, we are not isolated or unaided. Unseen intelligent energy forces guide each of us through the gate. New arrivals in the spirit world have little time to float around wondering where they are or what is going to happen to them next. Our guides and a number of soulmates and friends wait for us close to the gateway to provide recognition, affection, and the assurance we are all right. Actually, we feel their presence from the moment of death, because much of our initial readjustment depends upon the influence of these kindly entities toward our returning soul. 3. Homecoming Since encountering friendly spirits who meet us after death is so important, how do we recognize them? I find a general consensus of opinion among subjects in hypnosis about how souls look to each other in the spirit world. A soul may appear as a mass of energy, but apparently it is also possible for non-organic soul energy to display human characteristics. Souls often use their capacity to project former life forms when communicating with each other. Projecting a human life form is only one of an incalculable number of appearances, which can be assumed by souls from their basic energy substance. Later on, in Chapter 6, I will discuss another feature of soul identity the possession of a particular color aura. Most of my subjects report the first person they see in the spirit world as their personal guide. However, after any life we can be met by a soulmate. Guides and soulmates are not the same. If a former relative or close friend appears to the incoming soul, their regular guide might be absent from the scene. I find that usually guides are somewhere in close proximity, monitoring the incomer's arrival in their own way. The soul in my next case has just come through the spiritual gateway and is met by an advanced entity who obviously has had close connections with the subject over a prolonged series of past lives. Although this soulmate entity is not my client's primary guide, he is there to welcome and provide loving encouragement for her. Case 6 Dr. N. What do you see around you? Subject it's as if I'm drifting along on pure white sand, which is shifting around me. And I'm under a giant beach umbrella with brightly colored panels, all vaporized, but banded together, too. Dr. N., is anyone here to meet you? Subject, pause. I thought I was alone, but... A long hesitation. In the distance... Ah, oh, light, moving fast towards me. Oh, my gosh. Dr. N., what is it? Subject, excitedly. Uncle Charlie. Loudly. Uncle Charlie, I'm over here. Dr. N., why does this particular person come to meet you first? Subject, in a preoccupied, far-off voice. Uncle Charlie, I've missed you so much. Dr. N., I repeat my question. Subject. Because of all my relatives, I loved him more than anybody. He died when I was a child, and I never got over it. On a Nebraska farm in this subject's most immediate past life. Dr. N., how do you know it's Uncle Charlie? Does he have features you recognize? 
Subject. Subject is squirming with excitement in her chair. Sure. Sure, just as I remember him. Jolly. Kind. Lovable. He's next to me. Chuckles. Dr. N. What is so funny? Subject. Uncle Charlie is just as fat as he used to be. Dr. N. And what does he do next? Subject. He is smiling and holding out his hand to me. Dr. N. Does this mean he has a body of some sort with hands? Subject. Laughs. Well, yes and no. I'm floating around and so is he. It's... In my mind, he is showing all of himself to me, and what I am most aware of is his hand stretched out to me. Dr. N., why is he holding out his hand to you in a materialized way? Subject, pause, to comfort me, to lead me further into the light. Dr. N., and what do you do? Subject, I'm going with him. And we are thinking about the good times we spent together playing in the hay on the farm. Dr. N. And he is letting you see all this in your mind so you will know who he is? Subject. Yes, as I knew him in my last life. So I won't be afraid. He knows I am still a little shocked over my death. Subject had died suddenly in an automobile accident. Dr. N. Then... Right after death, no matter how many deaths we may have experienced in other lives, it is possible to be a little fearful until we get used to the spirit world again? Subject. It's not really fear. That's wrong. More like I'm apprehensive, maybe. It varies for me each time. The car crash caught me unprepared. I'm still a little mixed up. Dr. N. All right. Let's go forward a bit more. What is Uncle Charlie doing now? Subject. He is taking me to the place I should go. Dr. N. On the count of three, let's go there. One, two, three. Tell me what is happening. Subject. Long pause. There are other people around, and they look friendly as I approach... They seem to want me to join them. Dr. N. Continue to move towards them. Do you get the impression they might be waiting for you? Subject. Recognition. Yes! In fact, I realize I have been with them before. Pause. No, don't go. Dr. N. What's happening now? Subject. Very upset. Uncle Charlie is leaving me. Why is he going away? Dr. N. I stop the dialogue to use standard calming techniques in these circumstances, and then we continue. Look deeply with your inner mind. You must realize why Uncle Charlie is leaving you at this point. Subject. More relaxed, but with regret. Yes. He stays in a different place than I do. He just came to meet me, to bring me here. Dr. N. I think I understand. Uncle Charlie's job was to be the first person to meet you after your death and see you were okay. I'd like to know if you feel better now and more at home. Subject. Yes, I do. That's why Uncle Charlie has left me with the others. A curious phenomenon about the spirit world is that important people in our lives are always able to greet us, even though they may already be living another life in a new body. This will be explained in Chapter 6. In Chapter 10, I will examine the ability of souls to divide their essence so they can be in more than one body at a time on Earth. Usually at this juncture in a soul's passage, the carry-on luggage of Earth's physical and mental burdens are diminishing for two reasons. First, the evidence of a carefully directed order and harmony in the spirit world has brought back the remembrance of what we left behind— before we chose life in physical form. Secondly, there is the overwhelming impact of seeing people we thought we would never meet again after they died on earth. Here is another example. Case 7 Dr. N. 
Now that you have had the chance to adjust to your surroundings in the spirit world, tell me what effect this place has on you. Subject. It's so warm and comforting. I'm relieved to be away from Earth. I just want to stay here always. There's no tension or worries, only a sense of well-being. I'm just floating. How beautiful. Dr. N. As you continue to float along, what is your next major impression as you pass the spiritual gateway? Subject. Pause. Familiarity. Dr. N. What is familiar? Subject. After some hesitation. Um, people. Friends. Are here, I think. Dr. N. Do you see these people as familiar people on Earth? Subject. I have a sensation of their presence. People I knew. Dr. N. All right, keep moving along. What do you see next? Subject. Lights. Soft. Kind of cloudy-like. Dr. N. As you are moving, does this light continue to look the same? Subject. No, they are growing. Blobs of energy. And I know they are people. Dr. N. Are you moving toward them or are they coming toward you? Subject. We are drifting toward each other. But I am going slower than they are because I am uncertain what to do. Dr. N. Just relax and continue floating while reporting back to me everything you see. Subject. Pause. Now I'm seeing half-formed human shapes. From the waist up only. Their outlines are transparent too. I can see through them. Dr. N. Do you see any sort of features to these shapes? Subject. Anxiously. Eyes. Dr. N. You see just eyes? Subject. There is only a trace of a mouth. It's nothing. Alarmed. The eyes are all around me now, coming closer. Dr. N. Does each entity have two eyes? Subject. That's right. Dr. N. Do these eyes have the appearance of human eyes with an iris and pupil? Subject. No. Different. They are larger. Black orbs radiating light towards me. Thought. Then with a relieved sigh. Oh. Dr. N. Go on. Subject. I'm starting to recognize them. They are sending images into my mind. Thoughts about themselves and... The shapes are changing into people. Dr. N. People with physical human features. Subject. Yes. Oh, look, it's him. Dr. N. What do you see? Subject. Begins to laugh and cry at the same time. I think it's... Yes, it's... Larry, he is in front of everybody else. He is the first one I really see. Larry, Larry. Dr. N. After giving my subject a chance to recover a little, the sole entity of Larry is in front of an assortment of people you know? Subject. Yes. Now I know the ones I want to see the most are in front. Some of my other friends are in the back. Dr. N. Can you see them all clearly? Subject. No, the ones in back are hazy, far off. But I have the sensation of their presence. Larry is in front, coming up to me. Larry! Dr. N. Larry is the husband from your last life you told me about earlier? Subject. Subject rushes on. Yes, we had such a wonderful life together. Gunther was so strong. Everyone was against our marriage and his family. Jean deserted from the Navy to save me from the bad life I was living in Marseille, always wanting me. This subject is so excited, her past lives are tumbling one on top of the other. Larry, Gunther, and Jean were all former husbands, but the same soulmate. 
I was glad we had a chance to review earlier who these people were in sessions before this interval of recall in the spirit world. Besides Larry, her recent American husband, Jean was a French sailor in the 19th century, and Gunther was the son of German aristocrats living in the 18th century. Dr. N. What are the two of you doing right now? Subject. Embracing. Dr. N. If a third party were to look at the two of you embracing at this moment, what would they see? Subject. No answer. Dr. N. The subject is so engrossed in the scene with her soulmate, there are tears streaming down her face. I wait a moment and then try again. What would you and Larry look like to someone watching you in the spirit world right now? Subject. They would see... Two masses of bright light whirling around each other, I guess. Subject begins to settle down, and I help wipe the tears off her face with a tissue. Dr. N. And what does this signify? Subject. We are hugging. Expressing love. Connecting. It makes us happy. Dr. N. After you meet your soulmate, what happens next? Subject. Subject tightly grips the recliner arms. Oh, they are all here. I only sensed them before. Now more are coming closer to me. Dr. N., and this happens after your husband comes near you? Subject, yes. Mother, she is coming over to me. I've missed her so much. Oh, Mom. Subject begins to cry again. Dr. N., all right. Subject. Oh, please don't ask me any questions now. I want to enjoy this. Subject appears to be in silent conversation with her mother of the last life. Dr. N., I wait for a minute. Now, I know you are enjoying this meeting, but I need you to help me know what is going on. Subject, in a faraway voice. We... we are just holding each other. It's so good to be with her again. Dr. N. How do you manage to hold each other with no bodies? Subject, with a sigh of exasperation at me. We envelop each other in light, of course. Dr. N. Tell me what that is like for spirits. Subject, like being wrapped in a bright, light blanket of love. Dr. N. I see, then... Subject. Subject interrupts with a high-pitched laugh of recognition. Tim! It's my brother. He died so young. A drowning accident at age 14 in her last life. It's so wonderful to see him here. Subject waves her arm. And there is my best girlfriend, Wilma, from next door. We are laughing together over boys like we did while sitting up in her attic. Dr. N., after subject mentions her aunt and a couple of other friends, what do you think determines the sequence of how all these people come here to greet you? Subject. Pause. Why, how much we all mean to each other. What else? Dr. N. And with some you have lived many lives, while with others perhaps only one or two? Subject. Yes. I have been with my husband the most. Dr. N., do you see your guide around anywhere? Subject, he is here. I see him floating off to the side. He knows some of my friends, too. Dr. N., why do you call your guide a him? Subject, we all show what we want of ourselves. He always relates to me with a masculine nature. It's right and very natural. Dr. N., and does he watch over you in all your lives? Subject. Sure. And after death, too. Here. And he's always my protector. Our reception committee is planned in advance for us as we enter the spirit world. This case demonstrates how uplifting familiar faces can be to the incoming younger soul. I find there are a different number of entities waiting in greeting parties after each life. Although the meeting format varies, depending on a soul's special needs, I have learned there is nothing haphazard about our spiritual associates, 
knowing exactly when we are due and where to meet us upon our arrival in the spirit world. Frequently, an entity who is significant to us will be waiting a little in front of the others who want to be on hand as we come through the gateway. The size of welcoming parties not only changes for everyone after each life, but is drastically reduced to almost nothing for more advanced souls, where spiritual comfort becomes less necessary. Case 9 at the end of this chapter is an example of this type of spiritual passage. Cases 6 and 7 both represent one of the three ways newly arrived souls are received back into the spirit world. These two souls were met shortly after death by a principal entity, followed by others of decreasing influence. Case 7 recognized people more quickly than Case 6. When we meet such spirits in a gathering right after our death, we find they have been spouses, parents, grandparents, siblings, uncles, aunts, cousins, and dear friends in our past lives. I have witnessed some gut-wrenching emotional scenes with my clients at this stage of their passage. The emotional meetings which take place between souls at this interval in a spiritual passage are only a prelude to our eventual placement within a specific group of entities at our own maturity level. These meetings provide another emotional high for a subject in superconscious recall. Spiritual organizational arrangements involving how groups form and are cross-matched with other entities will be described in subsequent chapters. For the present, it is important we understand welcoming entities may not be part of our own particular learning group in the spirit world. This is because all the people who are close to us in our lives are not on the same developmental level. Simply because they choose to meet us right after death out of love and kindness does not mean they will be part of our spiritual learning group when we arrive at the final destination of this journey. For instance, in case six, Uncle Charlie was clearly a more advanced soul than my subject and may even have been serving in the capacity of a spiritual guide. It was evident to me that one of the primary tasks of Uncle Charlie's soul was to help Case 6 as a child in the life just ended, and his responsibility continued right after my subject's death. With Case 7, the important first contact was Larry, a true soulmate on the same level as this subject. Notice also in Case 7 that my subject's spiritual guide was not conspicuous among her former relatives and friends. However, as the scene unfolded, there were indications of a spiritual guide orchestrating the whole meeting process while remaining in the background. I see this in many cases. The second manner in which we are met right after death involves a quiet, meaningful encounter with one spiritual guide where no one else is revealed in the immediate vicinity, as in Case 5. Case 8 further illustrates this sort of meeting. What type of after-death meeting we do experience appears to involve the particular style of our spiritual guide, along with requisites of our individual character. I find the duration of this first meeting with our guides does vary after each life, depending upon the circumstances of that life. Case 8 shows the very close relationships people have with their spiritual guides. Many guides have strange-sounding names, while others are rather conventional. I find it interesting that the old-fashioned religious term of having a guardian angel is now used metaphysically to denote an empathetic spirit. To be honest, this is a term I once denigrated as being foolishly loaded with wishful thinking and representing an outdated mythology at odds with the modern world. I don't have that belief anymore about guardian angels. I am repeatedly told that the soul itself is androgynous, and yet in the same breath, clients declare sex is not an unimportant factor. I have learned all souls can and do assume male and female mental impressions toward other entities as a form of identity preference. Cases 6 and 7 show the importance of the newly arrived soul in seeing familiar faces identified by gender. This is also true of the next case. Another reason why I selected case 8 is to indicate how and why souls choose to visually appear in human form to others in the spirit world. Case 8 Dr. N You have just started to actually leave the Earth's astral plane now, and are moving further and further into the spirit world. I want you to tell me what you feel. 
Subject. The silence. So peaceful. Dr. N. Is anyone coming to meet you? Subject. Yes, it's my friend Rachel. She is always here for me when I die. Dr. N. Is Rachel a soulmate who has been with you in other lives? Or is she someone who always remains here? Subject. With some indignation. She doesn't always stay here, no. She is with me a lot in my mind when I need her. She is my own guardian, said with possessive pride. Note, the attributes of guides as differentiated from soulmates and other supportive entities will be examined in Chapter 8. Dr. N., why do you call this entity a she? Aren't spirits supposed to be sexless? Subject, that's right, in a literal way, because we are capable of both attributes— Rachel wants to show herself to me as a woman for the visual knowing, and it is a mental thing as well with her. Dr. N. Are you locked into male or female attributes during your spiritual existence? Subject. No. As souls, there are periods in our existence when we are more inclined toward one gender than another. Eventually, this natural preference evens out. Dr. N. Would you describe how Rachel's soul actually looks to you at this moment? Subject, quietly. A youngish woman, as I remember her best. Small, with delicate features. A determined expression on her face. So much knowledge and love. Dr. N., then you have known Rachel on Earth? Subject, responding with nostalgia. Once, long ago. She was close to me in life. Now she is my guardian. Dr. N., and what do you feel when you look at her? Subject, a calmness, tranquility, love. Dr. N., do you and Rachel actually look at each other with eyes in a human way? Subject, hesitates, sort of, but different. You see the mind behind what we take to be eyes because that is what we relate to on Earth. Of course, we can do the same thing as humans on Earth, too. Dr. N., what can you do on Earth with your eyes that can also be done in the spirit world? Subject. When you look into a certain person's eyes on the ground, even people you have just met and see a light you have known before, well, that tells you something about them. As a human, you don't know why, but your soul remembers. Note, I have heard about the light of spiritual identity being reflected in the human eyes of a soulmate, expressed in a variety of ways for many clients. As for myself, I have knowingly experienced this instant recognition only once in my life at the moment I first saw my own wife. The effect is startling, and a bit eerie as well. Dr. N., are you saying that sometimes on earth, when two people look at each other, they may feel they have known one another before? Subject. Yes, it's deja vu. Dr. N. Let's go back to Rachel in the spirit world. If your guardian did not project an image of herself in human form to you, would you have known her anyway? Subject. Well, naturally, we can always identify each other by the mind. But it's nicer this way. I know it sounds crazy, but it's a social thing. Seeing a familiar face puts you at ease. Dr. N. Seeing human features of people you knew in past lives is a good thing, then? Particularly in the readjustment period right after leaving Earth? Subject. Yeah, otherwise you feel a little lost at first. Lonesome. That may be confused, too. Seeing people as they were helps me get used to things here faster when I first come back. And seeing Rachel is always a big boost. Dr. N., does Rachel present herself to you in human form right after each death on Earth as a way of getting you readjusted to the spirit world? Subject, eagerly. Oh, yes, she does. And she gives me security. I feel better when I see others I have known before, too. Dr. N., and do you speak to these people? Subject, no one speaks. We communicate by the mind. Dr. N., telepathically? Subject, yes. Dr. N. 
Is it possible for souls to have private conversations which cannot be telepathically picked up by others? Subject. Pause. For intimacy. Yes. Dr. N. How is this done? Subject. By touch. It's called touching communication. Note. When two spirits come so close to each other, they are conjoined. My subjects say that they can send private thoughts by touch, which passes between them as electrical sound impulses. In most instances, subjects in hypnosis do not wish to talk to me about these personal confidences. Dr. N., could you clarify for me how human features can be projected by you as a soul? Subject. From my mass of energy. I just think of the features I want, but I can't tell you what gives me the ability to do this. Dr. N. Well, then, can you tell me why you and the other souls project certain features at different times? Subject. Long pause. It depends on where you are in your movements around here. When you see another, add your state of mind, then. Dr. N., that's what I want to get at. Tell me more about recognition. Subject. You see, recognition depends on a person's feelings when you meet them here. They will show you what they want you to see of themselves and what they think you want to see. It also depends on the circumstances of your meeting with them. Dr. N., can you be more specific? What different circumstances can cause energy forms to materialize in a certain way toward other spirits? Subject. It is the difference between your being on their turf or your turf. They may choose to show you one set of features in one place, while in another you might see something else. Note. Spiritual territory will be explained as we proceed further into the spirit world. Dr. N., are you telling me that a soul may show you one face at the gateway to the spirit world and another image later in a different situation? Subject. That's right. Dr. N. Why? Subject. Like I was telling you, a lot of how we present ourselves to each other depends on what we are feeling right then, what relationship we have with a certain person and where we are. Dr. N. Please tell me if I understand all this correctly. The identity souls project to each other depends on timing and location in the spirit world, as well as mood, and maybe psychological states of mind when they meet? Subject. Sure. And it works both ways. It's interconnecting. Dr. N. Then how can we know the true character of a soul's consciousness with all these changes in each other's image? Subject. Laughs. The image you project never hides who you really are from the rest of us. Anyway, it's not the same kind of emotion we know on Earth. Here it is more... abstract. Why we project certain features and thoughts is based on a... confirmation of ideas. Dr. N. Ideas? Do you mean your sentiments at the time? Subject. Yes, sort of. Because these human features were part of our physical lives in other places when we discovered things and developed ideas. It is all a continuum for us to use here. Dr. N. Well, if in each of our past lives we have a different face, which one do we assume between lives? Subject. We mix it up. You assume those features which the person you see will most recognize as you, depending on what you want to communicate. Dr. N., what about communication without projecting features? Subject, sure, we do that, it's normal, but I mentally associate with people more quickly with features. Dr. N., do you favor projecting a certain set of facial features? Subject, hmm, I like the face with the mustache, having a rock-hard jaw. Dr. N., you mean when you were Jeff Tanner, the cowpuncher from Texas and the life we discussed earlier? Subject. Laughs. <laughs> That's it. And I have had faces like Jeff's in other lives, too. Dr. N. But why Jeff? Was it just because he was you in your last life? Subject. No, I felt good as Jeff. 
It was a happy, uncomplicated life. Damn, I looked great. My face resembled those billboard smoking ads you used to see along the highway. Chuckling. I enjoy showing off my handlebar mustaches, Jeff. Dr. N. But that was only one life. People not associated with you in that life may not recognize you here. Subject. Oh, they would get it was me soon enough. I could change to something else, but I like myself as Jeff the best right now. Dr. N. So this goes back to what you were saying about all of us really only having one identity, regardless of the number of facial features we might project as souls? Subject. Yeah, you see everyone as they truly are. Some only want their best side to show because of what you might think of them. They don't fully appreciate that it is what you are striving for which is important, not how you appear. We get a lot of laughs about how spirits think they should look, even taking faces they never had on Earth, and that's okay. Dr. N. Are we talking about the more immature souls, then? Subject. Yes, usually. They can get stuck. We don't judge. In the end, they are going to be all right. Dr. N. I think of the spirit world as a place of supreme, all-knowing, intelligent consciousness. Then you make it appear that souls have moods and vanity as though they were back on Earth. Subject. Burst of laughter. People are people no matter how they look on their physical worlds. Dr. N. Oh, do you see souls who have gone to planets other than Earth? Subject. Pause. Once in a while. Dr. N. What features do souls from other planets besides Earth show you? Subject, evasively. I kind of stick with my own people, but we can assume any features we want for communication. Note. Gaining information from the subjects I have had who are able to recall leading physical past lives in non-human form on other worlds is always challenging. Recollection of these experiences are usually limited to older, more advanced souls, as we will see later. Dr. N. Is this ability to transmit features to each other as souls a gift the Creator provided for us based upon spiritual need? Subject. How should I know? I'm not God. The concept of souls having fallibility comes as a surprise to some people. The statements of Case 8 and all my other clients indicate most of us are still far from perfect beings in the spirit world. The essential purpose of reincarnation is self-improvement. The psychological ramifications of our development, both in and out of the spirit world, is the foundation of my work. We have seen the importance of meeting other entities while entering the spirit world. Besides uniting with our guides and other familiar beings, I have mentioned a third form of reentry after death. This is the rather disconcerting manner in which a soul is met by no one. Although it is an uncommon occurrence for most of my clients, I still feel a little sorry for those subjects who describe how they are pulled by unseen forces all alone to their final destinations, where contact is finally made with others. This would be akin to landing in a foreign country where you have been before, but without any baggage handlers or a tourist information desk to assist you with directions. I suppose what bothers me the most about this type of entry is the apparent lack of any soul acclimation. My own conceptions of what it must be like to be alone at the spiritual gateway and beyond is not shared by those souls who utilize the option of going solo. Actually, people in this category are experienced travelers. As older, mature souls, they seem to require no initial support system. They know right where they are going after death. I suspect the process is accelerated for them as well, because they manage to more rapidly wind up where they belong than those who stop to meet others. Case 9 is a client who has had a great number of lives, spanning thousands of years. About eight lives before his current one, people finally stopped meeting him at the spiritual gate. Case 9 Dr. N. What happens to you at the moment of death? Subject I feel a great sense of release, and I move out fast. Dr. N. How would you characterize your departure from Earth into the spirit world? Subject. I shoot up like a column of light, and I'm on my way. Dr. N. Has it always been this fast for you? 
Subject. No, only after my last series of lives. Dr. N. Why? Subject. I know the way. I don't need to see anybody. I'm in a hurry. Dr. N. And it doesn't bother you that you are not met by anyone? Subject. Laughs. <laughs> there was a time when it was good, but I don't require that sort of thing anymore. Dr. N. Whose decision was it to allow you to enter the spirit world without assistance? Subject. Pause, and then with a shrug. It was a mutual decision, between my teacher and me, when I knew I could handle things by myself. Dr. N. And you don't feel rather lost or lonely right now? Subject. Are you kidding? I don't need my hand held anymore. I know where I'm going and I'm anxious to get there. I'm being pulled along by a magnet and I just enjoy the ride. Dr. N. Explain to me how this pulling process works, which will take you to your destination. Subject. I am riding on a wave, a beam of light. Dr. N. Is this beam electromagnetic or what? Subject. Well, it's similar to the bands of a radio with someone tuning the dial and finding the right frequency for me. Dr. N. Are you saying you are being guided by an invisible force without much voluntary control, and that you can't speed things up as you did right after death? Subject. Yes, I must go with the wave bands of light. The waves have direction, and I'm flowing with it. It's easy. They do it all for you. Dr. N. Who does it for you? Subject. The ones in control? I don't really know. Dr. N. Then you are not in control. You don't have the responsibility of finding your own destination. Subject. Pause. My mind is in tune with the movement. I flow with the resonance. Dr. N. Resonance? You hear sounds? Subject. Yes, the wave beam vibrates. I am locked into this, too. Dr. N. Let's go back to your statement about the radio. Is your spiritual travel influenced by vibrational frequencies such as high, medium, and low resonance quality? Subject, laughing. Ah, that's not bad. Yes, and I'm on a line like a homing beacon of sound and light, and it's part of my own tonal pattern, my frequency. Dr. N. I'm not sure I understand how light and vibration combine to set up directional bands. Subject. Think of a monster tuning fork inside a flashing strobe light. Dr. N. Oh, then there is energy here? Subject. We have energy within an energy field. So it isn't just the lines we travel on. We generate energy ourselves. We can use these forces depending on our experience. Dr. N. Then your maturity level does give you some element of control in the rate and direction of travel. Subject. Yes, but not right here. Later, when I'm settled, I can move around much more on my own. Now I'm being pulled and I'm supposed to go with it. Dr. N. Okay, stay with this and describe to me what happens next. Subject. Short pause. I'm moving alone, being homed into my proper space, going where I belong. In hypnosis, the analytical conscious mind works in conjunction with the unconscious mind to receive and answer messages directed to our deep-seated memories. The subject in Case 9 is an electrical engineer, and thus he utilized some technical descriptions to express his spiritual sensations. This client's predisposition to explain his thoughts on soul travel in technical terms was encouraged, but not dictated by my suggestions. All subjects bring their own segments of knowledge to bear on answering my questions about the spirit world. This case used physical laws familiar to him to describe motion, whereas another person might have said souls move in this tract within a vacuum. Before continuing with the passage of souls into the spirit world, I want to discuss those entities who either have not made it this far after physical death or will be diverted from the normal travel route. 4. The Displaced Soul There are souls who have been so severely damaged, they are detached from the mainstream of souls going back to a spiritual home base. Compared to all returning entities, the number of these abnormal souls is not large. However, what has happened to them on earth is significant, 
because of the serious effect they have on other incarnated souls. There are two types of displaced souls. Those who do not accept the fact their physical body is dead and fight returning to the spirit world for reasons of personal anguish, and those souls who have been subverted by, or had complicity with, criminal abnormalities in a human body. In the first instance, displacement is of the soul's own choosing, while in the second case, spiritual guides deliberately remove these souls from further association with other entities for an indeterminate period. In both situations, the guides of these souls are intimately concerned with rehabilitation, but because the circumstances are quite different between each type of displaced soul, I will treat them separately. The first type we call ghosts. These spirits refuse to go home after physical death, and often have unpleasant influences on those of us who would like to finish out our own human lives in peace. These displaced souls are sometimes falsely called demonic spirits, because they are accused of invading the minds of people with harmful intent. The subject of negative spirits has produced serious investigations in the field of parapsychology. Unfortunately, this area of spirituality has also attracted a fringe element of the unscrupulous associated with the occult, who prey on the emotions of susceptible people. The troubled spirit is an immature entity with unfinished business in a past life on earth. They may have no relation to the living person who is disrupted by them. It is true that some people are convenient and receptive conduits for negative spirits who wish to express their querulous nature. This means that someone who is in a deep meditative state of consciousness might occasionally pick up annoying signal patterns from a discarnated being whose communications can range from the frivolous to provocative. These unsettled entities are not spiritual guides. Real guides are healers and don't intrude with acrimonious messages. More often than not, these uncommon haunted spirits are tied to a particular geographic location. Researchers who have specialized in the phenomena of ghosts indicate those disturbed entities are caught in a no-man's land between the lower astral planes of Earth and the spirit world. From my own research, I don't believe these souls are lost in space, nor are they demonic. They choose to remain within the Earth plane after physical death for a time, by their own volition, due to a high level of discontent. In my opinion, they are damaged souls because they evidence confusion, despair, and even hostility to such an extent they want their guides to stay away from them. We do know a negative displaced entity can be reached and handled by various means, such as exorcism, to get them to stop interfering with human beings. Possessing spirits can be persuaded to leave and eventually make a proper transition into the spirit world. If we have a spirit world governed by order, with guides who care about us, how can maladaptive souls who exert negative energy upon incarnated beings be allowed to exist? One explanation is that we still have free will, even in death. Another is that since we endure so many upheavals in our physical universe, then spiritual irregularities and deviations from the normal exodus of souls ought to be anticipated as well. Also, ghosts only represent a divided portion of a disturbed soul's energy, while the rest has returned to the spirit world for reunification. Discarnate, unhappy spirits who trap themselves are possibly part of a grand design. When they are ready, these souls will be taken by the hand away from Earth's astral plane and guided to their proper place in the spirit world. I turn now to the far more prevalent second type of disturbed soul. These are souls who have been involved with evil acts. We should first speculate if a soul can be considered culpable or guilt-free when it occupied the offending criminal brain. Is the soul mind or human ego responsible, or are they the same? Occasionally, a client will say to me, I feel possessed by an inner force which tells me to do bad things. There are mentally ill people who feel driven by opposing forces of good and evil over which they believe they have no control. After working for years with the superconscious minds of people under hypnosis, I have come to the conclusion that the five-sensory human can negatively act upon a soul's psyche. We express our eternal self through dominant biological needs, 
and the pressures of environmental stimuli which are temporary to the incarnated soul. Although there is no hidden, sinister self within our human form, some souls are not fully assimilated. People not in harmony with their bodies feel detached from themselves in life. This condition does not excuse souls from doing their utmost to prevent evil involvement on earth. We see this in human conscience. It is important we distinguish between what is exerting a negative force on our mind and what is not. Hearing an inner voice, which may suggest self-destruction to ourselves or someone else, is not a demonic spiritual entity, an alien presence, nor a malevolent renegade guide. Negative forces emanate from our self. The destructive impulses of emotional disorders, if left untreated, inhibit soul development. Those of us who have experienced unresolved personal trauma in our lives carry the seeds of our own destruction. This anguish affects our soul in such a way that it seems we are not whole. For instance, excessive craving and addictive behavior, which is the outgrowth of personal pain, inhibits the expression of a healthy soul, and may even hold a soul in bondage to its host body. Does the extent of contemporary violence mean that we have more souls going wrong today than in the past? If nothing else, our overpopulation and mind-altering drug culture should support this conclusion. On the positive side, Earth's international level of consciousness toward human suffering appears to be rising. I've been told that in every era of Earth's bloody history, there has always been a significant number of souls unable to resist and successfully counter human cruelty. Certain souls, whose hosts have a genetic disposition to abnormal brain chemistry, are particularly at risk in a violent environment. We see how children can be so damaged by physical and emotional family abuse that as adults, they commit premeditated acts of atrocity without feelings of remorse. Since souls are not created perfect, their nature can be contaminated during the development of such a life form. If our transgressions are especially serious, we call them evil. My subjects say to me no soul is inherently evil, although it may acquire this label in human life. Pathological evil in humans is characterized by feelings of personal impotence and weakness, which is stimulated by helpless victims. Although souls who are involved with truly evil acts should generally be considered at a low level of development, soul immaturity does not automatically invite malevolent behavior from a damaged human personality. The evolution of souls involves a transition from imperfection to perfection based upon overcoming many difficult body assignments during their task-oriented lives. Souls may also have a predisposition for selecting environments where they consistently don't work well or are subverted. Thus, souls may have their identity damaged by poor life choices. However, all souls are held accountable for their conduct in the bodies they occupy. We will see in the next chapter how souls receive an initial review of their past life with guides before moving on to join their friends. But what happens to souls who have, through their bodies, caused extreme suffering to another? If a soul is not capable of ameliorating the most violent human urges in its host body, how is it held accountable in afterlife? This brings up the issue of being sent to heaven or hell for good and bad deeds, because accountability has long been a part of our religious traditions. On the wall of my office hangs an Egyptian painting, The Judgment Scene, as represented in the Book of the Dead, which is a mythological ritual of death over 7,000 years old. The ancient Egyptians had an obsession with death and the world beyond the grave, because in their cosmic pantheon, death explained life. The picture shows a newly deceased man arriving in a place located between the land of the living and the kingdom of the dead. He stands by a set of scales about to be judged for his past deeds on earth. The master of ceremonies is the god Anubis, who carefully weighs the man's heart on one pan of the scale against the ostrich feather of truth on the opposite side. The heart, not the head, represented the embodiment of a person's soul conscience to the Egyptians. It is a tense moment. A crocodile-headed monster is crouched nearby with his mouth open, ready to devour the heart 
if the man's wrongs outweigh the good he did in life. Failure at the scales would end the existence of this soul. I get quite a few comments from my clients about this picture. A metaphysically oriented person would insist no one is denied entrance into the kingdom of afterlife, regardless of how unfavorably balanced the scales might be toward past conduct. Is this belief true? Are all souls given the opportunity to transmute back into the spirit world the same way, irrespective of their association with the bodies they occupied? To answer this question, I should begin by mentioning that a large segment of society believes all souls do not go to the same place. More moderate theology no longer stresses the idea of hellfire and brimstone for sinners. However, many religious sects indicate a spiritual coexistence of two mental states of good and evil. For the bad soul, there are ancient philosophical pronouncements denoting a separation from the god essence as a means of punishment after death. The Tibetan Book of the Dead, a source of religious belief thousands of years older than the Bible, describes the state of consciousness between lives, the bardo, as a time when the evil we have perpetrated projects us into spiritual separation. If the people of the East believed in a special spiritual location for evildoers, was this idea similar to the concept of purgatory in the Western world? From its earliest beginnings, Christian doctrine defined purgatory as a transitory state of temporary banishment for sins of a minor nature against humanity. The Christian purgatory is supposed to be a place of atonement, isolation, and suffering. When all negative karma is removed, these souls are eventually allowed into heaven. On the other hand, souls committing major, deadly sins are condemned to hell forever. Does hell exist to permanently separate good souls from bad ones? All my casework with the spirits of my subjects has convinced me there is no residence of terrible suffering for souls, except on earth. I am told all souls go to one spirit world after death, where everyone is treated with patience and love. However, I have learned that certain souls do undergo separation in the spirit world, and this happens at the time of their orientation with guides. They are not activated along the same travel routes as other souls. Those of my subjects who have been impeded by evil report that souls whose influence was too weak to turn aside a human impulse to harm others will go into seclusion upon re-entering the spirit world. These souls don't appear to mix with other entities in the conventional manner for quite a while. I have also noticed that those beginner souls who are habitually associated with intensely negative human conduct in their first series of lives must endure individual spiritual isolation. Ultimately, they are placed together in their own group to intensify learning under close supervision. This is not punishment, but rather a kind of purgatory for the restructuring of self-awareness with these souls. Because wrongdoing takes so many forms on earth, spiritual instruction and the type of isolation used is varied for each soul. The nature of these variations apparently is evaluated during orientation at the end of each life. Relative time of seclusion and reindoctrination is not consistent either. For instance, I have had reports about maladjusted spirits who have returned back to earth directly after a period of seclusion in order to expunge themselves as soon as possible by a good incarnated performance. Here is an example, as told to me by a soul who was acquainted with one of these spirits. Case 10 Dr. N. Do souls bear responsibility for their involvement with flawed human beings who injure others in life? Subject. Yes. Those who have wronged others savagely in a life. I knew one of those souls. Dr. N. What do you know about this entity? What happened after this soul returned to the spirit world following that life? Subject. He had hurt a girl terribly and did not rejoin our group. There was extensive private study for him, because he did so poorly while in that body. Dr. N. What was the extent of his punishment? Subject. Punishment is a wrong interpretation. It's regeneration. 
You have to recognize this is a matter for your teacher. The teachers are more strict with those who have been involved with cruelty. Dr. N. What does more strict mean to you in the spirit world? Subject. Well, my friend didn't go back with us, his friends, after this sad life where he hurt this girl. Dr. N. Did he come through the same spiritual gateway as yourself when he died? Subject. Yes, but he did not meet with anybody. He went directly to a place where he was alone with the teacher. Dr. N. And then what happened to him? Subject. After a while, not long, he returned to Earth again as a woman, where people were cruel, physically abusive. It was a deliberate choice. My friend needed to experience that. Dr. N. Do you think this soul blamed the human brain of his former host body for hurting the girl? Subject. No, he took what he had done back into himself. He blamed his own lack of skill to overcome the human failings. He asked to become an abused woman himself in the next life to gain understanding, to appreciate the damage he had done to the girl. Dr. N. If this friend of yours did not gain understanding and continued involving himself with humans who committed wrongful acts, could he be destroyed as a soul by someone in the spirit world? Subject. Long pause. You can't destroy energy exactly, but it can be reworked. Negativity, which is unmanageable in many lives, can be readjusted. Dr. N. How? Subject. Vaguely. Not by destruction. Remodeling. Case 10 did not respond further to this line of questioning. Another subject who knows something about these damaged souls are rather sparse with their information. Later, we will learn a bit more about the formation and restoration of intelligent energy. Most errant souls are able to solve their own problems of contamination. The price we pay for our misdeeds and the rewards received for good conduct revolve around the laws of karma. Perpetrators of harm to others will do penance by setting themselves up as future victims in a karmic cycle of justice. The Bhagavad Gita, another early Eastern scripture which has stood the test of thousands of years, has a passage which says, Souls of evil influence must redeem their virtue. No study of life after death would have any meaning without addressing how karma relates to causality and justice for all souls. Karma by itself does not denote good or bad deeds, Rather, it is the result of one's positive and negative actions in life. The statement, there are no accidents in our lives, does not mean karma by itself impels. What it does is propel us forward by teaching lessons. Our future destiny is influenced by a past from which we cannot escape, especially when we injure others. The key to growth is understanding we are given the ability to make mid-course corrections in our life and having the courage to make necessary changes when what we are doing is not working for us. By conquering fear and taking risks, our karmic pattern adjusts to the effects of new choices. At the end of every life, rather than having a monster waiting to devour our souls, we serve as our most severe critic in front of teacher guides. This is why karma is both just and merciful. With the help of our spiritual counselors and peers, we decide on the proper mode of justice for our conduct. Some people who believe in reincarnation also think if negative souls do not learn their lessons within a reasonable span of lives, they will be eliminated and replaced by more willing souls. My subjects deny this premise. There is no set path of self-discovery designed for all souls. As one subject told me, souls are assigned to earth for the duration of the war. This means souls are given the time and opportunity to make changes for growth. Souls who continue to display negative attitudes through their human hosts must overcome these difficulties by continually making an effort to change. From what I have seen, no negative karma remains attached to a soul who is willing to work during their many lives on this planet. It is an open question whether a soul should be held entirely at fault for humanity's irrational unsocialized and destructive acts. 
Souls must learn to cope in different ways with each new human being assigned to them. The permanent identity of a soul stamps the human mind with a distinctive character which is individual to that soul. However, I find there is a strange dual nature between the soul mind and human brain. I will discuss this concept further in later chapters, after the reader learns more about the existence of souls in the spirit world. 5. Orientation After those entities who meet us during our homecoming have dispersed, we are ready to be taken to a space of healing. This will be followed by another stop involving the soul's reorientation to a spiritual environment. In this place, we are often examined by our guide. I tend to call the cosmology of all spiritual locations as places or spaces simply for convenient identification, because we are dealing with a non-physical universe. The similarity of descriptions among clients of what they do as souls at the next two combined stops is remarkable, although they do have different names for them. I hear such terms as chambers, travel berths, and interspace stopover zones, but the most common is the place of healing. I think of the healing station as a field hospital, or MASH unit, for damaged souls coming off Earth's battlefields. I have selected a rather advanced male subject, who has been through this revitalization process many times, to describe the nature of this next stop. Case 11 Dr. N After you leave the friends who greeted you following your death, where does your soul go next in the spirit world? Subject I am alone for a while, moving through vast distances. Dr. N Then what happens to you? Subject I am being guided by a force I can't see into a more enclosed space, an opening into a place of pure energy. Dr. N What is this area like? Subject. For me, it is the vessel of healing. Dr. N. Give me as much detail as possible about what you experience here. Subject. I'm propelled in and I see a bright warm beam. It reaches out to me as a stream of liquid energy. There is a vapor-like steam swirling around me at first then gently touching my soul as if it were alive. Then it is absorbed into me as fire, and I am bathed and cleansed from my hurts. Dr. N., is someone bathing you, or is this light beam enveloping you from out of nowhere? Subject, I am alone, but it is directed. My essence is being bathed, restoring me after my exposure to earth. Dr. N., I have heard this place is similar to taking a refreshing shower after a hard day's work. Subject laughs. After a lifetime of work, it's better, and you don't get wet either. Dr. N. You also don't have a physical body anymore, so how can this energy shower heal a soul? Subject. By reaching into my being. I'm so tired from my last life and with the body I had. Dr. N. Are you saying the ravages of the physical body and the human mind leave an emotional mark on the soul after death? Subject. God, yes. My very expression, who I am as a being, was affected by the brain and body I occupied. Dr. N. Even though you are now separated from that body forever? Subject. Each body leaves an imprint on you, at least for a while. There are some bodies I have had that I can never get away from altogether. Even though you are free of them, you keep some of the outstanding memories of your bodies in certain lives. Dr. N. Okay. Now I want you to finish with your shower of healing and tell me what you feel. Subject. I am suspended in the light. It permeates through my soul, washing out most of the negative viruses. 
It allows me to let go of the bonds of my last life, bringing about my transformation so I can become whole again. Dr. N., does the shower have the same effect upon everyone? Subject. Pause. When I was younger and less experienced, I came here more damaged. The energy here seemed less effective because I didn't know how to use it to completely purge the negativity. I carried old wounds with me longer despite the healing energy. Dr. N., I think I understand. So what do you do now? Subject. When I am restored, I leave here and go to a quiet place to talk to my guide. This place I have come to call the Shower of Healing is only a prelude for the rehabilitation of returning souls. The orientation stage, which immediately follows, especially with younger souls, involves a substantial counseling session with one's guide. The newly refreshed soul arrives at this station to undergo a debriefing of the life just ended. Orientation is also designed as an intake interview to provide further emotional release and readjustment back into the spirit world. People in hypnosis who discuss the type of counseling which goes on during orientation say their guides are gentle but probing. Imagine your favorite elementary school teacher and you have the idea. Think of a firm but concerned entity who knows all about your learning habits, your strong and weak points, and your fears, who is always ready to work with you as long as you continue to try. When you don't, everything remains stationary in your development. Nothing can be hidden by students from their spiritual teachers. No subterfuge or deception exists in a telepathic world. There are a multitude of differences in orientation scenes, depending upon the soul's individual makeup and their state of mind after the life just ended. Souls report their orientation often takes place in a room. The furnishings of these settings and the intensity of this first conference can vary after each life. The case below gives a brief example of an orientation scene which attests to the desire of higher forces to bring comfort to the returning soul. Case 12 Subject At the center of this place I found my bedroom where I was so happy as a child. I see my rose-covered wallpaper and four-poster bed with the squeaky springs under a thick pink quilt made for me by my grandmother. My grandmother and I used to have heart-to-heart -heart chats whenever I was troubled, and she is here too, just sitting on the edge of my bed with my favorite stuffed animals around her, waiting for me, her wrinkled face is full of love as always. After a while, I see she is actually my guide, Amethyst, I talk to Amethyst about the sad and happy times of the life I have finished. I know I made mistakes, but she is so kind to me. We laugh and cry together while I reminisce. Then we discuss all the things I didn't do that I might have done with my life. But in the end it's okay. She knows I must rest in this beautiful world. I'm going to relax. I don't care if I ever go back to Earth again, because my real home is here. Apparently, the more advanced souls do not require any orientation at this stage. This does not mean that ten percent of my clients in this category just sail right by their guides with a wave upon their return from Earth. Everybody is held accountable for their past lives. Performance is judged upon how each individual interpreted and acted upon their life roles. Intake interviews for the advanced souls are conducted with master teachers later. The less experienced entities are usually given special attention by counselors because the abrupt transition from the physical to a spiritual form is more difficult for them. The next case I have selected has a more in-depth therapeutic spiritual orientation. The exploration of attitudes and feelings with a view to reorienting future behavior is typical of guides. The client in case 13 is a strong, imposing, 32-year-old woman of above average height and weight, dressed in jeans, boots, and a loose-fitting sweatshirt, Hester arrived at my office one day in a state of agitation. Her presenting problems fell into three parts. She was dissatisfied with her life as a successful real estate broker as being too materialistic and unfulfilling. 
Hester also felt she lacked feminine sexuality. She mentioned having a closet full of beautiful clothes which were hateful to wear. This client then told me how she had easily manipulated men all her life because there is a male aggression about me which also makes me feel incomplete as a woman. As a young girl, she avoided dolls and wearing dresses because she was more interested in competitive sports with boys. Her masculine feelings had not changed with age, although she had found a man who became her husband because he accepted her dominance in their relationship. Hester said she enjoyed sex with him as long as she was in physical control and that he found this exciting. In addition, my client complained of headaches on the right side of her head above the ear, which after extensive medical examinations, doctors had attributed to stress. During our session, I learned this subject had experienced a recent series of male lives, culminating with a short life as a prosecuting attorney called Ross Feldon in the state of Oklahoma during the 1880s. As Ross, my client had committed suicide at age 33 in a hotel room by shooting himself in the head. Ross was in despair over the direction his life had taken as a courtroom prosecutor. As the dialogue progresses, the reader will notice displays of intense emotion. Regression therapists call this heightened response being in a state of revivification, meaning to give new life, as opposed to the alternative trance state where subjects are observer participants. Case 13 Dr. N. Now that you have left the shower of healing, where are you going? Subject, apprehensively. To see my advisor. Dr. N. And who is that? Subject, pause. D's. No, his name is Clodies. Dr. N. Did you talk to Clodies when you entered the spirit world? Subject. I wasn't ready yet. I just wanted to see my parents. Dr. N. Why are you going to see Clodies now? Subject. I am going to have to make some kind of accounting of myself. We go through this after all my lives, but this time I'm really in the soup. Dr. N. Why? Subject. Because I killed myself. Dr. N. When a person kills himself on earth, does this mean they will receive some sort of punishment as a spirit? Subject. No, no, there is no such thing here as punishment. That's an earth condition. Clodies will be disappointed that I bailed out early and didn't have the courage to face my difficulties. By choosing to die as I did means I have to come back later and deal with the same thing all over again in a different life. I just wasted a lot of time by checking out early. Dr. N. So no one will condemn you for committing suicide? Subject. Reflects for a moment. Well, my friends won't give me any pats on the back either. I feel sadness at what I did. Note. This is the usual spiritual attitude toward suicide. But I want to add that those who escape from chronic physical pain or almost total incapacity on earth by killing themselves feel no remorse as souls. Their guides and friends also have a more accepting view toward this motivation for suicide. Dr. N. All right. Let's proceed into your conference with Clodies. First, describe your surroundings as you enter this space to see your advisor. Subject. I go into a room with walls. Laughs. Oh, it's the buckhorn. Dr. N., what's that? Subject. A great cattleman's bar in Oklahoma. I was happy as a patron there. Friendly atmosphere. Beautiful wood paneling. The stuffed leather chairs. Pause. I see Clodies is sitting at one of the tables waiting for me. Now we are going to talk. Dr. N. How do you account for an Oklahoma bar in the spirit world? Subject. It's one of the nice things they do for you to ease your mind, but that's where it ends. Then with a deep sigh. This talk is not going to be like a party at the bar. Dr. N. You sound a little depressed at the prospect of an intimate conversation with your guide about your last life. 
subject, defensively. Because I blew it. I have to see him to explain why things didn't work out. Life is so hard. I tried to do it right, but... Dr. N. Do what right? Subject, with anguish. I had an agreement with Clodies to work on setting goals and then following through. He had expectations for me as Ross. Damn! Now I have to face him with this. Dr. N. You don't feel you met the contract you had with your advisor about lessons to be learned as Ross? Subject, impatiently. No, I was terrible. And of course I'll have to do it all over again. We never seem to get it perfect. Pause. You know, if it weren't for Earth's beauty, the birds, flowers, trees, I would never go back. It's too much trouble. Dr. N. I can see we're upset, but don't you think... Subject breaks in with agitation. You can't get away with a thing, either. Everybody here knows you so well. There is nothing I can keep from Clodies. Dr. N. I want you to take a deep breath and go further into the buckhorn bar, and tell me what you do. Subject. Subject gulps and squares her shoulders. I float in and sit down across from Clodie's at a round table near the front of the bar. Dr. N. Now that you are near Clodie's, do you think he is as upset as you are over this past life? Subject. No. I'm more upset with myself over what I did and didn't do, and he knows that. Advisors can be displeased, but they don't humiliate us. They are too superior for that. The counseling input of a directive guide gives the healing process of our soul a boost during orientation, but that does not mean the defensive barriers to progress are completely removed. The painful emotional memories from our past do not die as easily as our bodies. Hester must see her negative past life script as Ross clearly, without distorted perceptions. Recreating spiritual orientation scenes during hypnosis assists me as a therapist. I have found the techniques of psychodramatic role-playing to be useful in exposing feelings and old beliefs related to current behavior. Case 13 had quite a long orientation which I have condensed. At this juncture of the case, I shifted my questioning to involve the subject's guide. As the proceedings unfold with Ross Feldon's life, I will take the role of a third-party intermediary between Ross and Clodie's. Within this counseling mode, I also want to initiate a role transference where Hester, Ross, will speak the thoughts of Clodies. The integration of a subject with their guide is a means of eliciting assistance from these higher entities and bringing problems into sharper focus. I sometimes sense even my own guide is directing me in these sessions. I am cautious about summoning up guides without good cause. Facilitating communication directly with a client's guide always has an uncertain outcome. If my intrusion is clumsy or unnecessary, guides will block a subject's response by silence or use metaphoric language which is obscure. I have had guides speak through a subject's vocal cords in raspy tones, which are so discordant I can hardly understand the responses to questions. When subjects talk for their guides, rather than guides speaking for themselves through the subject, usually the cadence of speech is not as broken. In this case, Clodies comes through Hester Ross easily and allows me some latitude in working with his client. Dr. N. Ross, we both need to understand what is happening psychologically to you right from the start of your orientation with Clodies. I want you to assist me. Are you willing to do this? Subject. Yes, I am. Dr. N. Good. And now you are going to be able to do something unusual. On the count of three, you will have the ability to assume the dual roles of Clodies and yourself. This ability will enable you to speak to me about your thoughts and those of your guide as well. It will seem that you will actually become your guide when I question you. Are you ready? Subject, with hesitation. I think so. Dr. N. Rapidly. One, two, three. I place my palm on the subject's forehead to stimulate the transference. Now. 
Be Clodes speaking his thoughts through you. You are sitting at a table across from the soul of Ross Felden. What do you say to him? Quickly. I want the subject to react without thinking critically about the difficulty of my command. Subject. Subject reacts slowly, speaking as his own guide. You know, you could have done better. Dr. N., quickly now, be Ross Felden again. Move to the other side of the table and answer Clodies. Subject. I tried, but I fell short of the goal. Dr. N., switch places again. Become the voice of Clodies' thoughts and answer Ross, quickly. Subject. If you could change anything about your life, what would it be? Dr. N., respond as Ross. Subject. Not to be corrupted by power and money. Dr. N., answer as Clodies. Subject. Why did you let these things detract from your original commitment? Dr. N., I lower my voice. You are doing fine. Keep switching chairs back and forth at the table. Now answer your guide's question. Subject. I wanted to belong, to feel important in the community, to rise above others and be admired for my strength. Dr. N., respond as Clodies. Subject. Especially by women. I observed you tried to dominate them sexually as well, making conquests without attachments. Dr. N., speak as Ross. Subject. Yes, that's true. Shakes head from side to side. I don't have to explain. You know everything anyway. Dr. N., respond as Clodies. Subject. Oh, but you do. You must bring your self-awareness to bear on these matters. Dr. N., answer as Ross. Subject, defiantly. If I hadn't exerted power over these people, they would have controlled me. Dr. N., respond as Clodies. Subject, this lacks merit and was unworthy of you. What you became is not how you started. We chose your parents carefully. Note, the Felden family were farmers of modest means, who displayed honesty, forbearance, and sacrificed much so Ross could study law. Dr. N. Answer is Ross. Subject. In a rush. Yes, I know. They brought me up to be idealistic, to help the little guy, and I wanted this too. But it didn't work for me. You saw what happened. I was in debt when I began as a lawyer. Ineffective, of no consequence. I didn't want to be poor anymore, defending people who couldn't pay me. I hated the farm, the pigs and the cows. I liked being around substantial people, and when I joined the establishment as a prosecutor, I had the idea of reforming the system and helping farm people. It was the system that was wrong. Dr. N. Respond as Clodies. Subject. Ah, you were corrupted by the system. Explain this to me. Dr. N. Answer is Ross. Subject. Hotly. People had to pay fines they couldn't afford. Others I sent to jail because of offenses they didn't mean to commit. Others I had hung. Voice breaks. I became a legal killer. Dr. N. Respond as Clodies. Subject. Why did you feel responsible for prosecuting criminals who were guilty of hurting others? Dr. N. Answer is Ross. Subject. Few of those... Most were... Just ordinary people like my parents who got caught up in the system, needing money to survive. And there were those who were... Sick in the head. Dr. N. Respond as Clodies. Subject. What about the victims of the people you prosecuted? Didn't you choose a life of law to help society and to make the farms and the towns safer with justice? Dr. N. Answer is Ross. Subject. Loudly. Don't you see? It didn't work for me. I was turned into a murderer by a primitive society. Dr. N. Respond as Clodies. Subject. And so you murdered yourself? Dr. N. Answer is Ross. Subject. I got off track. I couldn't go back to being a nobody. And I couldn't go forward. Dr. N. Respond as Clodies. 
Subject. Too easily you became a participant with those whose motivations were for personal gain and notoriety. This was not you. Why did you hide from yourself? Dr. N. Answer is Ross. Subject. With anger. Why didn't you help me more when I started as a public defender? Dr. N. Respond as Clodies. Subject. What benefit do you get from thinking I should pick you up at every turn? Dr. N. I ask Hester to respond as Ross, but when she remains silent after the last question, I step in. Ross, if I may interrupt, I believe Clodies is inquiring into the payoff for you from both the pain you feel now and strokes you get from blaming him over your last life. Subject. Pause. Wanting sympathy, I guess. Dr. N. Okay. Respond as Clodies to this thought. Subject. Very slowly. What more would you have me do? You didn't reach far enough inside yourself. I placed thoughts in your mind of temperance, moderation, responsibility, original goals, your parents' love. You ignored these thoughts and were stubborn to alternative action. Subject. Ross responds without my command. I know I missed the signs you set up. I wasted opportunities. I was afraid. Dr. N. Respond as Clodies to your statement. Subject. What do you value most about who you are? Dr. N. Answer your guide. Subject. That I had the desire to change things on Earth. I started with wanting to make a difference for the people of Earth. Dr. N. Respond as Clodies. Subject. You left that assignment early, and now I see you missing opportunities again, being afraid to take risks, taking paths which damage you, trying to become someone who is not you, and there is sadness again. Recreating the orientation stage does not produce abrupt transitions during my hypnosis sessions. While Case 13 is speaking as Clodies, Notice how her responses take on a more lucid and decisive quality, which is different from either my client Hester or her former self as Ross. I am not always successful with my subjects translating their guide's comments so insightfully in former spiritual orientations. Nevertheless, past life memories often spill over into contemporary problems in whatever spiritual setting is selected. Whether my subject or her guide actually directed the conversation in the Buckhorn Bar scene, while I moved the time frame around, does not matter to me. After all, Ross Felden as a person is dead. But Hester is caught in the same quagmire, and I want to do what I can to break this destructive pattern of behavior. I spend a few minutes reviewing with this subject what her guide has indicated about lack of self-concept, alienation, and lost values. After asking Clodies for his continued assistance, I close the orientation scene and immediately take Hester to a later spiritual stage, just before her rebirth today. Dr. N. With all the knowledge of who you were as Ross, and having a greater understanding of your real spiritual identity after your stay in the spirit world, why did you choose your current body? Subject. I chose to be a woman so people would not feel intimidated by me. Dr. N. Really? Then why did you take the body of such a strong, forceful woman in the twentieth century? Subject. They won't see a prosecuting attorney dressed in black in a courtroom. This time I am a surprise package. Dr. N. A surprise package? What does that mean? Subject. As a woman, I knew I would be less intimidating to men. I can catch them off guard and scare them to death. Dr. N. What kind of men? Subject. The big guys. The power structure in society. Catch them when they are lulled into a false sense of security because I'm a woman. Dr. N. Catch them and do what? Subject. Drives her right fist into the left palm. Nail them to save the little guy from the sharks who want to eat up all the small fish in this world. Dr. N. I move my subject into the present while she remains in the superconscious state. 
Let me understand your reason for choosing to be a woman in this life. You wanted to help the same sort of people who you were unable to help as a man in your previous life. Is this correct? Subject. Sadly. Yeah, but it's not the best way. It's not working out for me like I thought. I'm still too strong and macho. Energy is pouring out of me in the wrong direction. Dr. N. What wrong direction? Subject. Wistfully. I'm doing it again. Misusing people. I chose the body of a woman who is intimidating to men, and I don't feel like a woman. Dr. N., give me an example. Subject. Sexually and in business, I'm in the power game again, pushing aside principles, getting off track as before, as Ross. This time I manipulate real estate deals. I'm too interested in acquiring money. I want status. Dr. N., and how does this hurt you, Hester? Subject. The influence of money and position is a drug to me as it was in my last life. My being a woman now has done nothing to change my desire to control people. So stupid. Dr. N. Then do you think your motivations were wrong in choosing to be a female? Subject. Yes. I do feel more natural living as a man. But I thought as a woman this time around I would be more subtle. I wanted this chance to try again in a different sex, and Clodie's let me take it. Client slumps down in her chair. What a blunder. Dr. N. Don't you think you are being a little hard on yourself, Hester? I have the sense you also chose to be a woman because you wanted a woman's insight and intuition to give you a different perspective to tackle your lessons. You can have masculine energy, if you want to call it that, and still be feminine. Before finishing this case, I should touch on the issue of homosexuality. Most of my subjects select the bodies of one gender over another 75% of the time. This pattern is true of all but the advanced souls, who maintain more of a balance in choosing to be men and women. A gender preference by a majority of earthbound souls does not mean they are unhappy the other 25% of the time as males or females. Hester is not necessarily gay or bisexual because of her body choice. Homosexuals may or may not be comfortable with their anatomy as humans. When I do have a client who is gay, they often ask if their homosexuality is the result of choosing to be the wrong sex in this life. When their sessions are over... This inquiry is usually answered. Regardless of the circumstances which lead souls to make gender choices, this decision was made before arriving on Earth. Sometimes I find that gay people have chosen in advance of their current lives to experiment with a sex that was seldom used in former lives. Being gay carries a sexual stigma in our society, which presents a more difficult road in life. When this road is chosen by one of my clients... It can usually be traced to a karmic need to accelerate personal understanding of the complex differences in gender identity, as related to certain events in their past. Case 13 chose to be a woman in this life to try and get over the stumbling blocks experienced as Ross Felden. Would Hester have benefited from knowing about her past as Ross from birth, rather than having to wait over 30 years and undergo hypnosis? Having no conscious memory of our former existences is called amnesia. This human condition is perplexing to people attracted to reincarnation. Why should we have to grope around in life trying to figure out who we are and what we are supposed to do and wondering if some spiritual divinity really cares about us? I close my session with this woman by asking about her amnesia. Dr. N. Why do you think you had no conscious memory about your life as Ross Felden? Subject. When we choose a body and make a plan before coming back to Earth, there is an agreement with our advisors. Dr. N. An agreement about what? Subject. We agree not to remember other lives. Dr. N. Why? Subject. Learning from a blank state is better than knowing in advance what could happen to you because of what you did before. Dr. N. 
But wouldn't knowing about your past life mistakes be valuable in avoiding the same pitfalls in this life? Subject If people knew all about their past, many might pay too much attention to it rather than trying out new approaches to the same problem. The new life must be taken seriously. Dr. N. Are there any other reasons? Subject. Pause. Without having old memories, our advisors say there is less preoccupation for trying to avenge the past to get even for the wrongs done to you. Dr. N. Well, it seems to me that so far this has been part of the motivation and conduct in your life as Hester. Subject. Forcefully. That's why I came to you. Dr. N. And do you still think a total blackout of our eternal spiritual life on earth is essential to progress? Subject. Normally, yes. But it's not a total blackout. We get flashes from dreams during times of crisis. People have an inner knowing of what direction to take when it is necessary. And sometimes your friends can fudge a little. Dr. N. By friends, you mean entities from the spirit world? Subject. Uh-huh. They give you hints by flashing ideas. I've done it. Dr. N. Nevertheless, you had to come to me to unlock your conscious amnesia. Subject. Pause. We have the capacity to know when it is necessary. I was ready for change when I heard about you. Clodies allowed me to see the past with you because it was to my benefit. Dr. N. Otherwise your amnesia would have remained intact. Subject. Yes, that would have meant I wasn't supposed to know certain things yet. In my opinion, when clients are unable to go into hypnosis at any given time, or if they have only sketchy memories in trance, there is a reason for this blockage. This does not mean these people have no past memories just that they are not ready to have them exposed. My client knew something was hindering her growth and wanted it revealed. The superconscious identity of the soul houses our continuous memory, including goals. When the time in our lives is appropriate, we must harmonize human material needs with our soul's purpose for being here. I try to take a common-sense approach in bringing past and present experiences into alignment. Our eternal identity never leaves us alone in the bodies we choose, despite our current status. In reflection, meditation, or prayer, the memories of who we really are do filter down to us in selective thought each day. In small intuitive ways, through the cloud of amnesia, we are given clues for the justification of our being. By desensitizing the source of her headaches, I completed my session with Hester by reinforcing her choice to be a woman for reasons other than intimidating men. I gave her permission to lower her defenses a little and be less aggressive. We discussed options for restructuring occupational goals toward the helping professions and the possibilities of volunteer service work. She was finally able to see her life today as a great opportunity for learning rather than a failure of gender choice. After a case is completed... I never cease to admire the brutal honesty of souls. When a soul has led a productive life beneficial to themselves and those around them, I notice they return to the spirit world with enthusiasm. However, when subjects like Case 13 report they wasted a past life, especially from early suicide, then they describe going back rather dejected. When orientation is upsetting to a subject... I find an underlying reason is the abruptness with which a soul is once again in full possession of all past knowledge. After physical death, unencumbered by a human body, the soul has a sudden influx of perception. The stupid things we did in life hit us hard in orientation. I see more relaxation and greater clarity of thought as I move my subjects further into the spirit world. Souls are created in a positive matrix of such love and wisdom that when a soul starts to come to a planet like Earth and join the physical beings who have evolved from a primitive state, the violence is a shock. Humans have the raw negative emotions of anger and hate as an outgrowth of their fear and pain, 
connected with survival going back to the Stone Age. Both positive and negative emotions are mixed between soul and host for their mutual benefit. If a soul only knew love and peace, it would gain no insight and never truly appreciate the value of these positive feelings. The test of reincarnation for a soul coming to earth is the conquering of fear in a human body. A soul grows by trying to overcome all negative emotions connected to fear through perseverance in many lifetimes, often returning to the spirit world bruised or hurt, as Case 13 indicated. Some of this negativity can be retained even in the spirit world and may reappear in another life with a new body. On the other hand, there is a trade-off. It's in joy and unabashed pleasure that the true nature of an individual soul is revealed on earth in the face of a happy human being. Orientation conferences with our guides allow us to begin the long process of self-evaluation between lives. Soon we will have another conference, this time with more master beings in attendance. In the last chapter, I referred to the ancient Egyptian tradition of newly deceased souls being taken into a hall of judgment to account for their past lives. In one form or another, the concept of a torturous courtroom trial awaiting us right after death has been part of the religious belief system of many cultures. Occasionally, a susceptible individual in a traumatic situation will say they had an out-of-body experience with nightmarish visions being taken by frightening specters into an afterlife of darkness where they were sentenced in front of demonic judges. In these cases, I suspect a strong preconditioned belief system of hell. In the quiet, relaxing state of hypnosis, with continuity on all mental levels, my subjects report that the initial orientation session with their guides prepares them to go before a panel of superior beings. However, the words courtroom and trial are not used to describe these proceedings. A number of my cases have called these wise beings, directors, and even judges, but most refer to them as a council of masters or elders. This board of review is generally composed of between three and seven members, and since souls appear before them after arriving at their home base, I will go into this conference in more detail at the end of the next chapter. All soul evaluation conferences, be they with our guides, peers, or a panel of masters, have one thing in common. The feedback and past life analysis we receive in terms of judgment is based upon the original intent of our choices as much as the actions of a lifetime. Our motivations are questioned and criticized, but not condemned in such a way as to make us suffer. As I explained in Chapter 4, this does not mean souls are exonerated for their acts which harmed others simply because they are sorry. Karmic payment will come in a future life. I have been told that our spiritual masters constantly remind us that because the human brain does not have an innate moral sense of ethics, conscience is the soul's responsibility. Nevertheless, there is overwhelming forgiveness in the spirit world. This world is ageless, and so too are our learning tasks. We will be given other chances in our struggle for growth. When the initial conference with our guide is over, we leave the place of orientation and join a coordinated flow of activity involving the transit of enormous numbers of other souls into a kind of central receiving station. 6. Transition All souls, regardless of experience, eventually arrive at a central port in the spirit world, which I call the staging area. I have said there are variations in the speed of soul movement right after death, depending upon spiritual maturity. Once past the orientation station, there seems to be no further travel detours for anyone entering this space of the spirit world. Apparently, large numbers of returning souls are conveyed in a spiritual form of mass transit. Sometimes, souls are escorted by their guides to this area. I find this practice is especially true for the younger souls. Others are directed through by an unseen force, which pulls them into the staging area and then beyond to waiting entities. From what I am able to determine, accompaniment by other entities depends upon the volition of one's guide. In most cases, haste is not an issue, 
But souls do not dawdle along on this leg of their journey. The feelings we have along this path depend on our state of mind after each life. The assembly and transfer of souls really involves two phases. The staging area is not an encampment space. Spirits are brought in, collected, and then projected out to their proper final destinations. When I hear accounts of this particular junction, I visualize myself walking with large numbers of travelers through the central terminal of a metropolitan airport, which has the capacity to fly all of us out in any direction. One of my clients described the staging area as resembling the hub of a great wagon wheel, where we are transported from a center along the spokes to our designated places. My subjects say this region appears to them as having a large number of unacquainted spirits moving in and out of the hub in an efficient manner with no congestion. Another person called this area the Los Angeles Freeway without gridlock. There may be other similar wheel hubs with freeway-type on- and off-ramps in the spirit world, but each client considers their own route to and from this center to be the only one. The observations I hear about the nature of the spirit world when entering the staging area have definitely changed from those first impressions of layering and foggy stratification. It is as if the soul is now traveling through the loosely wound arms of a mighty galactic cloud into a more unified celestial field. While their spirits hover in the open arena of the staging area, preparing for further transport out to prescribed spaces, I enjoy listening to the excitement in the voices of my subjects. They are dazzled by an eternal world spread out before them and believe that somewhere within lies the nucleus of creation. When they look at the fully opened canopy around them, subjects will state that the spirit world appears to be a varied luminescence. I hear nothing about the inky blackness we associate with deep space. The gatherings of souls that clients see in the foreground in this amphitheater appear as myriads of sharp star lights, all going in different directions. Some move fast, while others drift. The more distant energy concentrations have been pictured as islands of misty veils. I am told the most outstanding characteristic of the spirit world is a continuous feeling of a powerful mental force directing everything in uncanny harmony. People say this is a place of pure thought. Thought takes many forms. It is at this vantage point in their return that souls begin to anticipate meeting others who wait for them. A few of these companions may have already been seen at the gateway, but most have not. Without exception, souls who wish to contact each other, especially when on the move, do so by just thinking of the entity they want. Suddenly, the individual called will appear in the soul mind of the traveler. These telepathic communications by the energy of all spiritual entities allow for a non-visual affinity, while two energy forms who actually come near one another provide a more direct connection. There is uniformity in the accounts of my subjects as to their manner of spiritual travel, routes, and destinations, although what they see along the way is distinctive with each person. I searched through my case files to find a subject whose experiences along this route to an ultimate spiritual destination was both descriptive and yet representative of what many others have told me. I selected an insightful 41-year-old graphic designer with a mature soul. This man's soul had traveled over this course many times between a long span of lives. Case 14 Dr. N. You are now ready to begin the final portion of your homeward journey toward the place where your soul belongs in the spirit world. On the count of three, all the details of this final leg of your travels will become clear to you. It will be easy for you to report on everything you see, because you are familiar with the route. Are you ready? Subject. Yes. Dr. N. Raising my voice to a commanding tone. One. We are getting started. Two, your soul has now moved out of the area of orientation. Three, quickly, what is your first impression? Subject, distances are unlimited. 
Endless space. Forever. Dr. N. So are you telling me the spirit world is endless? Subject. Long pause. To be honest, from where I am floating, it looks endless. But when I begin to really move, it changes. Dr. N. Changes how? Subject. Well, everything remains formless. But when I am gliding faster, I see I'm moving inside a gigantic bowl, turned upside down. I don't know where the rims of the bowl are, or even if any exist. Dr. N. Then movement gives you the sense of a spherical spirit world? Subject. Yes, but it's only a feeling of enclosed uniformity when I am moving rapidly. Dr. N. Why does rapid movement, your speed, give you the feeling of being in a bowl? Subject. Long pause. It's strange. Although everything appears to go on straight when my soul is drifting, that changes to a feeling of roundness when I am moving fast on a line of contact. Dr. N., what do you mean by a line of contact? Subject, towards a specific destination. Dr. N., how does moving with speed on a given line of travel change your observational perceptions of the spirit world to a feeling it is round? Subject, because with speed the lines seem to bend. They curve in a more obvious direction for me and give me less freedom of movement. Note, other subjects who are also disposed toward linear descriptions speak of traveling along directional force lines which have the spatial properties of a grid system. One person called them vibrational strings. Dr. N., by less freedom, do you mean less personal control? Subject. Yes. Dr. N. Can you more precisely describe the movement of your soul along these curving contact lines? Subject. It's just more purposeful. When my soul is being directed someplace on a line, it's like I'm in a current of white water, only not as thick as water, because the current is lighter than air. Dr. N., then, in this spiritual atmosphere, you don't have the sense of density such as in water? Subject. No, I don't. But what I am trying to say is I'm being carried along as if I were in a current underwater. Dr. N., why do you think this is so? Subject. Well, it's as if we are all swimming, being carried along in a swift current which we can't control under somebody's direction, up and down from each other in space, with nothing solid around us. Dr. N., do you see other souls traveling in a purposeful way above and below you? Subject, yes. It's as if we start in a stream, and then all of us returning from death are pulled into a great river together. Dr. N., when do the numbers of returning souls seem the highest to you? Subject, when the rivers converge into... I can't describe it. Dr. N., please try. Subject, pause. We are gathered into... a sea, where all of us swirl around in slow motion. Then I feel as though I'm being pulled away to a small tributary again, and it's quieter further from the thoughts of so many minds, going to the ones I know. Dr. N., later in your normal travels as a soul, is it the same as being propelled around in streams and rivers as you have just described? Subject. No, not at all. This is different. We are like salmon going up to spawn, returning home. Once we get there, we are not pushed about this way. Then we can drift. Dr. N., who is doing the pushing while you are being taken home? Subject, higher entities, the ones in charge of our movements to get us home. Dr. N., entities such as your guide. Subject, above him, I think. Dr. N., what else are you feeling at this moment? 
Subject. Peace. There is such peace you never want to leave again. Dr. N. Anything more? Subject. Oh, I have some anticipation, too, while moving slowly with the energy current. Dr. N. All right. Now I want you to continue to move further along with the current of energy, closer to the area where you are supposed to go. Look around carefully and tell me what you see. Subject. I see a variety of lights in patches, separated from each other by galleries. Dr. N. By galleries, do you mean a series of enclosures? Subject. Hmm. Uh, more like a long corridor, bulging out in places, stretching out away from me into the distance. Dr. N. And the lights? Subject. They are people. The souls of people within the bulging galleries reflecting light outward to me. That's what I'm seeing. Patches of lights bobbing around. Dr. N. Are these clusters of people structurally separated from each other in the bulges along the corridor? Subject. No, there are no walls here. Nothing is structural with angles and corners. It's hard for me to explain exactly. Dr. N. You are doing fine. Now I want you to tell me what separates the light clusters from each other along this corridor you are describing? Subject. The people are divided by thin, wispy filaments, making the light milky like the transparency of frosted glass. There is an incandescent glow from their energy as I pass by. Dr. N. How do you see individual souls within the clusters? Subject, pause. As light dots. I see masses of dots hanging in clumps, as hanging grapes all lit up. Dr. N. Do these clumps represent various groups of soul energy masses with space between them? Subject, yes. They are separated into small groups. I am going to my own clump. Dr. N. What else do you feel about them as you pass by on the way to your cluster? Subject. I can feel their thoughts reaching out, so varied, but together, too. Such harmony, but... Stops. Dr. N. Go on. Subject. I don't know the ones I'm passing now. It doesn't matter. Dr. N. Okay. Let's pass on by these clusters which seem to bulge out along a corridor. Give me an example of what the whole thing looks like to you from a distance. Subject. Laughs. <laughs> a long glowworm. Its sides bulging in and out. The movement is rhythmic. Dr. N. You mean the corridor itself appears to move? Subject. Yes, parts of it. Swaying as a ribbon in the breeze while I am going further away. Dr. N. Continue floating and tell me what happens to you next. Subject. Pause. I'm at the edge of another corridor. I'm slowing down. Dr. N. Why? Subject. Grows excited. Because... Oh, good. I'm coming in towards the site where my friends are attached. Dr. N. And how do you feel at this moment? Subject. Fantastic. There's a familiar pulling of minds, reaching out to me. I'm catching the tail of their kite, joining them in thought. I'm home. Dr. N. Is your particular cluster group of friends isolated from the other groups of souls, living in other corridors? Subject. No one is really isolated, although some of the younger ones may think so. I've been around a long time, though, and I have a lot of connections. Said with modest confidence. Dr. N. So you felt connections with those other corridors, even with spirits in them you might not know from past experience? Subject. I do because of the connections I have had. There is a oneness here. Dr. N. When you are moving around as a spirit, 
What is the major difference in your interactions with other souls compared to being in human form on earth? Subject. Here no one is a stranger. There is a total lack of hostility toward anyone. Dr. N. You mean every spirit is friendly to every other spirit, regardless of prior associations in many settings? Subject. That's right. And it's more than just being friendly. Dr. N. In what way? Subject. We recognize a universal bond between us which makes us all the same. There is no suspicion toward each other. Dr. N. How does this attitude manifest itself between souls who first meet? Subject. By complete openness and acceptance. Dr. N. Living on earth must be difficult for souls, then. Subject. It is. For the newer ones especially, because they go to earth expecting to be treated fairly. When they aren't, it's a shock. For some, it takes quite a few lives to get used to the earth body. Dr. N. And if the newer souls are struggling with these earth conditions, are they less efficient when working within the human mind? Subject. I would have to say yes, because the brain drives a lot of fear and violence into our souls. It's hard for us. But that's why we come to Earth. To overcome. Dr. N. In your opinion, might the newer souls tend to be more fragile and in need of group support upon returning to their cluster? Subject. That's absolutely true. We all want to return home. Will you let me stop talking now so I can meet with my friends? I have touched upon the commonality of word usage by different clients to describe spiritual phenomena. Case 14 offered us a few more. I regularly hear such water words as currents and streams used to explain a flowing directional movement, where a sky word like cloud denotes a freedom of motion associated with drifting. Visual images, which call up expressions of energy mass and group clusters to indicate souls themselves, are especially popular. I have adopted some of this spiritual language myself. At the final debarkation zone for the incoming soul, waiting cluster groups of familiar entities may be large or small, depending upon the soul's developmental level and other factors, which I will take up as we get a little further along. By way of comparison with case 14, the next case demonstrates a more insular perception of the spirit world from a soul with less maturity. In case 15, the transition of this soul from the staging area to her home cluster is fairly rapid in her mind. The case is informative because it presents attributes of propriety felt by this soul to a designated space, as well as deference toward those who manage the system. Because this subject is less experienced and a bit edgy over what she sees as a need for conformity, we are given another interpretation of spiritual guidelines for group placement. Case 15 Dr. N I want to talk to you about your trip into the place where you normally stay in the spirit world. Your soul is now moving toward this destination. Explain what you see and feel. Subject, nervously I'm going outward somehow. Dr. N. Outward? Subject. Puzzled. I am floating along in a chain of some kind. It's as though I'm weaving through a series of connecting links, a foggy maze. Then it opens up. Oh! Dr. N. What is it? Subject. With awe. I have come into a grand arena. I see many others crisscrossing around me. Subject grows uncomfortable. Dr. N. Just relax. You are in the staging area now. Do you still see your guide? Subject, with hesitation. Yes, nearby. Otherwise I would be lost. It's so... vast. Dr. N. I place my hand on the subject's forehead. Continue to relax and remember you have been here before, although everything may seem new to you. What do you do now? Subject. 
I'm carried forward, rapidly, straight past others. Then I'm in an empty space, open. Dr. N., does this void mean everything is black around you? Subject, it's never black here. The light just contracts to darker shades because of my speed. When I slow down, things get brighter. Others confirm this observation. Dr. N., continue on and report back to me what you see next. Subject, after a while I see nests of people. Dr. N., you mean groups of people? Subject, yes. Like hives. I see them as bunches of moving lights. Fireflies. Dr. N. All right, keep moving and tell me what you feel. Subject, warmth, friendship, empathy. It's dreamy. Hmm. Dr. N., what is it? Subject, I have slowed way down. Things are different. Dr. N., how? Subject, more clearly defined. Pause. I know this place. Dr. N., have you reached your own hive, cluster group? Subject, long pause. Not yet, I guess. Dr. N., just look about you and report back to me exactly what you see and feel. Subject. Subject begins to tremble. There are bunches of people together, off in the distance, but there. Dr. N., what do you see? Subject, fearfully. People I know. Some of my family, off in the distance, but, with anguish, I don't seem to be able to reach them. Dr. N., why? Subject, in tearful bewilderment. I don't know. God, don't they know I'm here? Subject begins to struggle in her chair, and then extends her arm and open hand at my office wall. I can't reach my father. Note, I briefly stop my questioning. This client's father had a great influence in her most immediate past life, and she needs additional calming techniques. I also decide to reinforce her protective shield before continuing. Dr. N., what do you think is the reason your father is off in the distance so you can't reach him? Subject, during a long pause I use the time to dry subject's face, which has become wet with tears and perspiration. I don't know. Dr. N., I place my hand on subject's forehead and command, Connect with your father, now! Subject. After a pause, the subject relaxes. It's okay. He is telling me to be patient and everything will become clear to me. I want to go over there and be near him. Dr. N. And what does he tell you about that? Subject. Sadly. He says that he can always be in my mind if I need him, and I will learn to do this better. Think telepathically but he has to stay where he is. Dr. N., what do you think is the basic reason for your father remaining in this other place? Subject, tearfully. He does not belong in my hive. Dr. N., anything else? Subject, the directors, they don't. Crying again. I'm not, not sure. Note, Normally, I try to avoid too much intervention when subjects are describing their spiritual transitions. In this case, my client is confused and disoriented, so I offer a little guidance of my own. Dr. N., let's analyze why you can't reach your father's position right now. Could this separation be the result of higher entities believing this is a time for individual reflection on your part, and that you should associate only with other souls at your own level of development? Subject. Subject is more restored. Yes, those messages are coming through. I have to work things out for myself, with others like me. The directors encourage us, and my father is helping me understand, too. Dr. N., are you satisfied with this procedure? 
Subject. Pause. Yes. Dr. N. All right. Please continue with your passage from the moment you see some of your family in the distance. What happens next? Subject. Well, I'm still slowing down. Moving gradually. I'm being taken along a course I have been on before. I'm passing some other bunches of people. Group clusters. And I stop. Note. The final transit inward is especially important for the younger souls. One client, upon awakening, described this scene as giving him the sense he was arriving back home at twilight after a long trip. Having passed from the countryside into his town, he finally reached the proper street. The front windows of his neighbor's houses were lit, and he could see people inside as he drove slowly past, before reaching the driveway of his own home. Although people in trance may use such words as clumps and hives to describe how their home spaces look from a distance, this view becomes more individualistic once they go into each cluster. Then the subject's spiritual surroundings are associated with towns, schools, and other living areas identified with earthly landmarks of security and pleasure. Dr. N. Now that you are stationary, what are your impressions? Subject. It's... Large activity. There are a lot of people in the vicinity. Some are familiar to me. Others are not. Dr. N., can we get a little closer to all of them? Subject. Abruptly, my subject raises her voice with indignation. You don't understand. I don't go over there. Points a finger toward my office wall. Dr. N., what's the problem? Subject. I'm not supposed to. You can't just go off anywhere. Dr. N. But you have reached your destination? Subject. It doesn't matter. I don't go over there. Again points a finger at her mental picture. Dr. N. Does this tie in with the messages you received about your father? Subject. Yes, it does. Dr. N. Are you saying to me your soul energy cannot arbitrarily float anywhere, such as outside your group? Subject, pointing outward. They are not in my group over there. Dr. N. Define what you mean by over there. Subject, in a grave tone of voice. Those others nearby. That is their place. Points down to the floor. This is our place. We are here. Nod's head to confirm her statement. Dr. N. Who are they? Subject. Well, the others, of course. People not in my group. In a burst of nervous laughter. Oh, look! My own people! It's wonderful to see them again. They are coming toward me. Dr. N. I act as though I am hearing this information for the first time, to encourage spontaneous answers. Really? This does sound wonderful. Are these the same people who were involved with your past life? Subject. More than one life, I can tell you. With pride. These are my people. Dr. N. These people are entities who are members of your own group? Subject. Of course, yes. I have been with them for so long. Oh, it's fun seeing them all again. Subject is overjoyed, and I give her a few moments with this picture. Dr. N. I see quite a change in your understanding in just the short time since we arrived here. Look off in the distance at the others around this space. What is it like where they live? Subject. Agitated. I don't want to know. That is their business. Can't you see? I'm not attached to them. I'm too busy with the people I am supposed to be with here. People I know and love. Dr. N. I do see. But a few minutes ago you were quite distressed at not being able to get close to your father. Subject. I know now he has his own gathering place with people. Dr. N. Why didn't you know that when we arrived here? Subject. I'm not sure. I admit it was a shock at first. Now I know the way things are. It's all coming back to me. Dr. N. Why wasn't your guide around to explain all this to you before you saw your father? Subject. Long pause. 
I don't know. Dr. N. Probably other people you have known and loved besides your father are also in these groups. Are you saying you have no contact with them now that you are in your proper place in the spirit world? Subject. Upset with me. No, I have contact with my mind. Why are you being so difficult? I am supposed to stay here. Dr. N. I prod the subject once more to gain additional information. And you don't just drift over to those other groups for visits? Subject. No, you don't do that. You don't go into their groups and interfere with their energy. Dr. N. But mental contact offers no interference with their energy. Subject. At the right time, when they are free to do this with me. Dr. N. So what you are telling me is that everyone here is located in their own group spaces, and you don't go wandering around visiting or making too much mental contact at the wrong times? Subject, calming down. Yes, they are in their own spaces with instruction going on. It's the directors who move around mostly. Dr. N. Thank you for clearing all this up for me. You want me to know that you and your group friends are especially careful about infringing upon other spaces. Subject. That's right. At least that's the way things are around my space. Dr. N. And you don't feel confined by this custom? Subject. Oh, no. There are great expanses of space and such a sense of freedom here. As long as we pay attention to the rules. Dr. N. And what if you don't? Who decides what is the proper location for each group of souls? Subject. Pause. The teachers help us. Otherwise we would be lost. Dr. N. It seemed to me you were lost when we first arrived here. Subject. With uncertainty. I didn't connect. I wasn't mentally in tune. I messed up. I don't think you realize how big it is around here. Dr. N. Look around you at all the occupied spaces. Isn't the spirit world crowded with souls? Subject laughs. Sometimes we do get lost. That's our own fault. This place is big. That's why it never gets crowded. The two cases in this chapter represent different reactions from a beginner and a more advanced soul, recalling the final phase of their return passages back to the spirit world. Every participant has their own interpretation of the panoramic view from the staging area to the terminus in their cluster group. Some of my subjects find the transition from the gateway to group placement to be so rapid that they need time to adjust upon arrival. When recalling their memories between homecoming and placement, my subjects sometimes express concern that an important individual was not present in light form or did not communicate with them telepathically. Often this is a parent or spouse in the life just completed. By the end of the transition stage, the reason usually becomes evident. Frequently it has to do with embodiment. We have seen how the average returning soul is overwhelmed by pleasure. Familiar beings are clustered together in undulating masses of bright light. On occasion, resonating musical sounds with specific chords guide the incoming traveler. One subject remarked, as I come near my place, there is a monotone of many voices sounding the letter A, like A, for my recognition, and I can see them all vibrating fast as warm, bright energy, and I know these are disembodied ones right now. What this means is that those souls who are currently incarnated in one or more bodies at the moment may not be actively engaged with welcoming anybody back. Another subject explained, it is as if they are sleeping on autopilot. We always know who is out and who is in. Those souls who are not totally discarnated radiate a dim light with low pulsating energy patterns and don't seem to communicate much with anyone. Even so, these souls are able to greet the returning soul in a quiet fashion within the group setting. The sense of a barrier between various groups, as experienced by Case 15, has different versions among my subjects, depending upon the age of the soul. 
I will have another perspective about mobility in the next case. The average soul with a great deal of basic work to do describes the separation of their group from others as similar to being in different classrooms in the same schoolhouse. I have also had clients who felt they were entirely separated in their own schoolhouse. The analogy of spiritual schools directed by teacher guides is used so often by people under hypnosis that it has become a habit for me to use the same terminology. As I mentioned earlier, after souls arrive back into their soul groups, they are summoned to appear before a council of elders. While the council is not prosecutorial, they do engage in direct examination of a soul's activities before returning them to their groups. It is not unusual for my subjects to have some difficulty providing me with full details of what transpires at these hearings, and I am sure these blocks are intentional. Here is a report from one case. After I meet with my friends, my guide Veronica, subject's younger teacher, takes me to another place to meet with my panel of elders. She is at my side as an interpreter for what I don't understand, and to provide support for explanations of my conduct in the last life. At times, she speaks on my behalf as a kind of defense advocate, but Quazelle, subject senior guide who arrived before Veronica, carries the most weight with the panel. There are always the same six elders in front of me who wear long white robes. Their faces are kindly, and they evaluate my perceptions of the life I have just lived, and how I could have done better with my talents, and what I did that was beneficial. I am freely allowed to express my frustrations and desires. All the elders are familiar to me, especially two of them who address me more than the others and who look younger than the rest. I think I can distinguish appearances which are male or female. Each has a special aspect in the way they question me, but they are honest and truthful, and I am always treated fairly. I can hide nothing from them, but sometimes I get lost when their thoughts are transmitted back and forth in the rapid communication between them. When it is more than I can handle, Veronica translates what they are saying about me, although I have the feeling she does not tell me everything. Before I return to Earth, they will want to see me a second time. Souls consider themselves having finally arrived home when they rejoin familiar classmates in a group setting. Their attendance here with certain other souls does resemble an educational placement system in form and function. The criteria for group admission is based upon knowledge and a given developmental level. As in any classroom situation, some students connect well with teachers and others less so. The next chapter will examine the sorting out process for soul groups and how souls view themselves in their respective spiritual locations. 7. Placement My impression of the people who believe we do have a soul is that they imagine all souls are probably mixed into one great congregation of space. Many of my subjects believe this too, before their sessions begin. After awakening, it is no wonder they express surprise with the knowledge that everyone has a designated place in the spirit world. When I began to study life in the spirit world with people under hypnosis, I was unprepared to hear about the existence of organized soul support groups. I had pictured spirits just floating around aimlessly by themselves after leaving Earth. Group placement is determined by soul level. After physical death, a soul's journey back home ends with debarkation into the space reserved for their own colony, as long as they are not a very young soul or isolated for other reasons as mentioned in Chapter 4. The souls represented in these cluster groups are intimate old friends who have about the same awareness level. When people in trance speak of being part of a soul cluster group, they are talking about a small primary unit of entities who have direct and frequent contact, just as we would see in a human family. Peer members have a sensitivity to each other, which is far beyond our conception on Earth. Secondary groups of souls are arranged in the form of a community support group, which is much less intimate with one another. Larger secondary groups of entities are made up of giant sets of primary clusters, as lily pads in one pond. Spiritual ponds appear to be endless. Within these ponds, 
I have never heard of a secondary group estimated at less than a thousand souls. The many primary group clusters which make up one secondary group seem to have sporadic relationships or no contact at all between clusters. It is rare for me to find souls involved with each other in any meaningful way who are members of two different secondary groups, because the number of souls is so great it is not necessary. The smaller subgroup primary clusters vary in number, containing anywhere from three to twenty-five souls. I am told the average assemblage is around fifteen, which is called the inner circle. Any working contact between members of different cluster groups is governed by the lessons to be learned during an incarnation. This may be due to a past life connection or the particular identity trait of the souls involved. Soul acquaintanceships between members of different cluster groups usually involve peripheral roles in life on Earth. An example would be a high school classmate who was once a close friend, but who you now see only at class reunions. Members of the same cluster group are closely united for all eternity. These tightly knit clusters are often composed of like-minded souls with common objectives, which they continually work out with each other. Usually they choose lives together as relatives and close friends during their incarnations on earth. It is much more common for me to find the subject's brother or sister from former lives in the same cluster group, rather than souls who have been their parents. Parents can meet us at the gateway to the spirit world after a death on earth, but we may not see much of their souls in the spirit world. This circumstance exists not for reasons of maturity, since a parent's soul could be less developed than their human offspring. Rather, it is more a question of social learning between siblings, who are contemporary in one time frame. Although parents are a child's primary identification figures for both good and bad karmic effects, it is frequently our relations with spouses, brothers, sisters, and selected close friends over a whole lifetime that most influences personal growth. This takes nothing away from the importance of parents, aunts, uncles, and grandparents who serve us in different ways from another generation. The next case offers us an account of what it is like coming back to one's cluster group after physical death. Case 16 Dr. N Once you leave the staging area and have arrived in the spiritual space where you belong, what do you do then? Subject I go to school with my friends. Dr. N You mean you are in some kind of spiritual classroom? Subject Yes, where we study. Dr. N. I want you to take me through this school from the time of your arrival so I can appreciate what is happening to you. Start by telling me what you see from the outside. Subject, with no hesitation. I see a perfectly square Greek temple with large sculptured columns. Very beautiful. I recognize it because this is where I return after each cycle. Life. Dr. N. What is a classical Greek temple doing in the spirit world? Subject, shrugs. I don't know why it appears to me that way, except it seems natural, since my life's in Greece. Dr. N. All right, let's continue. Does anyone come to meet you? Subject, subject smiles broadly. My teacher, Carla. Dr. N. And how does she appear to you? Subject, confidently. I see her coming out of the entrance of the temple towards me, as a goddess, tall, wearing long flowing robes, one shoulder is bare, her hair is piled up and fastened with a gold clasp. She reaches out to me. Dr. N., look down at yourself. Are you dressed in the same garments? Subject, we all seem to be dressed the same. We shimmer with light. And we can change. Carla knows I like the way she looks. Dr. N. Where are the others? Subject. Carla has taken me inside my temple school. I see a large library. Small gatherings of people are speaking in quiet tones. At tables. It is sedate. Warm. A secure feeling which is so familiar to me. Dr. N. 
Do all these people appear as adult men and women? Subject. Yes, but there are more women in my group. Dr. N. Why? Subject. Because that's the valence they are most comfortable with right now. Note. The word valence used by this subject to indicate gender preference is an odd choice, yet it does fit. Valences in chemistry are positive or negative properties, which when combined with other elements give proportion. Souls in groups may be inclined toward male and female personages or mixed. Dr. N. Okay, what do you do next? Subject. Carla leads me to the nearest table and my friends immediately greet me. Oh, it's so good to be back. Dr. N. Why are these particular people here with you in this temple? Subject. Because we are all in the same study group. I can't tell you how happy I am to be with them once more. Subject becomes distracted with this scene, and it takes me a minute to get her started again. Dr. N. Tell me how many people are in this library with you. Subject. Pauses while mentally counting. About twenty. Dr. N. Are all twenty very close friends of yours? Subject. We are all close. I've known them for ages. But five are my dearest friends. Dr. N. Are every one of the twenty people at about the same level of learning? Subject. Uh, almost. Some are a little further along than the rest. Dr. N. Where would you place yourself in the group as far as knowledge? Subject. Around the middle. Dr. N. As to learning lessons, where are you in relation to your five closest friends? Subject. Oh, we are about the same. We work together a lot. Dr. N. What do you call them? Subject. Chuckles. We have pet names for each other. Dr. N. Why do you have nicknames? Subject. Hmm. To define our essence. We see each other as representing earth things. Dr. N. What is your pet name? Subject. Thistle. Dr. N. And this represents some personal attribute? Subject. Pause. I am known for sharp reactions to new situations in my rotations. Life cycles. Dr. N. What is the entity you feel closest to called, and why? Subject. Soft laughter. <laughs> Spray. He goes flat out in his rotations, dispensing his energy so rapidly it splashes in all directions, just like the water he loves so much on Earth. Dr. N. Your family group sounds very distinctive. Now, would you explain to me what you and your friends actually do in this library setting? Subject. I go to my table, and we all look at the books. Dr. N. Books? What sort of books? Subject. The life books. Dr. N. Describe them as best you can for me. Subject. They are picture books. Thick white edges. Two or three inches thick. Quite large. Dr. N. Open one of the life books for me and explain what you and your friends at the table see. Subject. Pause. While the subject's hands come together and move apart as though she were opening a book. There is no writing. Everything we see is in live pictures. Dr. N. Action pictures. Different than photographs? Subject. Yes, they are multidimensional. They move, shift, from a center of crystal which changes with reflected light. Dr. N. So the pictures are not flat. The moving light waves have depth? Subject. That's right. They are alive. Dr. N. Tell me how you and your friends use the books. Subject. Well, at first, it's always out of focus when the book is opened. Then we think of what we want. The crystal turns from dark to light and gets into alignment. Then we can see 
in miniature, our past lives and the alternatives. Dr. N. How is time treated in these books? Subject. By frames, pages, time is condensed by the life books. Dr. N. I don't want to dwell on your past right now, but take a look at the book and just tell me the first thing you see. Subject. A lack of self-discipline in my last life, because this is what is on my mind. I see myself dying young, in a lover's quarrel. My ending was useless. Dr. N., do you see future lives in the life book? Subject. We can look at future possibilities, in small bites only, in the form of lessons. Mostly these options come later with the help of others. These books are intended to emphasize our past acts. Dr. N., would you give me your impression of the intent behind this library atmosphere with your cluster group? Subject. Oh, we all help one another go over mistakes during this cycle. Our teacher is in and out, and so we do a lot of studying together and discuss the value of our choices. Dr. N., are there other groups where people study in this building? Subject. No, this is for our group. There are different buildings where various groups study near us. Dr. N., are the groups of people who study in these buildings more or less advanced than those in your group? Subject. Both. Dr. N., are you allowed to visit these other buildings where souls study? Subject. Long pause. There is one which we go to regularly. Dr. N., which one? Subject. A place for the newer ones. We help them when their teacher is gone. It's nice to be needed. Dr. N. Help them how? Subject. Laughs. With their homework. Dr. N. But don't the teacher guides have that responsibility? Subject. Well, you see, the teachers are so much further along in development this group appreciates our assistance because we can relate to them easily. Dr. N. Ah, so you do a little student teaching with this group. Subject. Yes, but we don't do it anywhere else. Dr. N. Why not? Why couldn't more advanced groups come to your library to assist you once in a while? Subject. They don't because we are further along than the newer ones, and we don't infringe on them either. If I want to connect with someone, I do it outside the study center. Dr. N., can you wander about anywhere as long as you don't bother other souls in their study areas? Subject. Responds with some evasiveness. I like to stay around the vicinity of my temple, but I can reach out to anyone. Dr. N., I get the impression that your soul energy is restricted to the spiritual space, even though you can mentally reach out further. Subject. I don't feel restricted. We have plenty of room to go about, but I'm not attracted to everyone. The statement about non-restriction, cited by Case 16, seems contrary to those boundaries of spiritual space seen by the last case. When I initially bring subjects into the spirit world, their visions are spontaneous, particularly as to spiritual order and their place in a community of soul life. While the average subject may talk about having private spaces, as far as living and working, none sees the spirit world as confining. Once their superconscious recall gets rolling, most people are able to tell me about having freedom of movement and going to open spaces where souls of many learning levels gather in a recreational atmosphere. In these communal areas, floating souls socially engage in many activities. Some are quite playful as when I hear of older souls teasing the younger ones about what lies ahead for them. One subject put it this way. We play tricks on each other like a bunch of kids. During hide-and-seek, some of the younger ones get lost, and then we can help them find themselves. I am also told guests can appear in soul groups at times to entertain and tell stories, similar to the troubadours of the Middle Ages. Another subject mentioned that her group loved to see an odd-looking character known as humor, show up, 
and make them all laugh with his antics. Frequently, people in hypnosis find it hard to clearly explain the strange meanings behind their intermingling as souls. One diversion I hear rather often is of souls forming a circle to more fully unify and project their thought energy. Always a connection with a higher power is reported here. Some people have told me, thought rhythms are so harmonized, they bring forth a form of singing. Gracefully subtle dancing can also take place when souls whirl around each other in a mixture of energy, blending and separating in exotic patterns of light and color. Physical things such as shrines, boats, animals, trees, or ocean beaches can be conjured up at the center of these dances as well. These images have special meaning to soul groups as planetary symbols, which reinforce positive memories from former lives together. This sort of material replication apparently does not represent sadness by spirits who long to be in a physical state again, but rather a joyful communion with historical events that helped shape their individual identities. For me, these mythic expressions by souls are ceremonial in nature, and yet they go far beyond basic ritual. Although certain places in the spirit world are described as having the same function by subjects in superconscious, their images in each of these regions can vary. Thus, a study area described as a Greek temple in this case is represented as a modern school building by another person. Other statements may seem more contradictory. For instance, many subjects mentally traveling from one location to another in the spirit world will tell me the space around them is like a sphere, as we saw in the last chapter. But then they will add that the spirit world is not enclosed because it is limitless. I think what we have to keep in mind is that people tend to structure their frame of reference during a trance state with what their conscious mind sees and has experienced on earth. Quite a few people who come out of trance tell me there is so much about the spirit world they were unable to describe in earthly terms. Each person translates abstract spiritual conditions of their experience into symbols of interpretation which make sense to them. Sometimes a subject will even express disbelief at their own visions when I first take them into a spiritual place. This is because the critical area of their conscious mind has not stopped dropping message units. People in trance soon adapt to what their unconscious mind is recording. When I began to gather information about souls in groups, I based my assessments of where these souls belonged on the level of their knowledge. Using only this criterion of identification, it was difficult for me to swiftly place a client. Case 16 came to me early in my studies of life in the spirit world. It was a significant one, because during the session, I was to learn about the recognition of souls by color. Before this case, I listened to my subjects describing the colors they were seeing in the spirit world without appreciating the importance of this information in relation to souls themselves. My clients reported about shades of soul energy mass, but I didn't piece these observations together. I was not asking the right questions. I was familiar with Curlian photography and the studies in parapsychology at UCLA, where research has indicated each living person projects their own colored aura. In human form, apparently we have an ionized energy field flowing out and around our physical bodies, connected by a network of vital power points called chakras. Since spiritual energy has been described to me as a moving living force, the amount of electromagnetic energy required to hold a soul on our physical plane could be another factor in producing different earthly colors. It has also been said that a human aura reflects thoughts and emotions combined with the physical health of an individual. I wondered if these personal meridians projected by humans had a direct connection to what I was being told about the light emitted by souls in the spirit world. With Case 16, I realized that radiated soul light visualized by spirits is not all white. In the minds of my subjects, every soul generates a specific color aura. I credit this case with helping me decipher the meaning of these manifestations of energy. Dr. N. All right. Let's float outside your temple of study. 
What do you see around you or off in the distance? Subject. People. Large gatherings of people. Dr. N. How many would you say? Subject. Hmm. In the distance. I can't count. Hundreds and hundreds. There are so many. Dr. N. And do you identify with all these souls? Are you associated with them? Subject. Not really. I can't even see all of them. It's, it's sort of fuzzy out there. But my gang is near me. Dr. N. If I could call your gang of about twenty souls your primary cluster group, are you associated with the larger secondary body of souls around you now? Subject. We are all associated, but not directly. I don't know those others. Dr. N. Do you see the physical features of all these other souls in the same way as you did your own group in the temple? Subject. No, that isn't necessary. It's more natural out here in the open. I see them all as spirits. Dr. N. Look out of the distance from where you are now. How do you see all these spirits? What are they like? Subject. Different lights. Buzzing around as fireflies. Dr. N. Can you tell if the souls who work with each other, such as teachers and students, stick together all the time? Subject. People in my gang do, but the teachers kind of stick to themselves when they are not assisting in our lessons. Dr. N. Do you see any teacher guides from where we are now? Subject. Pause. Some, yes. There are much fewer of them than us, of course. I can see Carla with two of her friends. Dr. N. And you know they are guides, even without seeing any physical features? You can look out there at all the bright white lights and just mentally tell they are guides? Subject. Sure, we can do that. But they are not all white. Dr. N. You mean souls are not all absolutely white? Subject. That's partially true. The intensity aspect of our energy can make us less brilliant. Dr. N. So Carla and her two friends display different shades of white? Subject. No, they aren't white at all. Dr. N. I don't follow you. Subject. She and her two friends are teachers. Dr. N. What is the difference? Are you saying these guides radiate energy which is not white? Subject. That's right. Dr. N. Well, what color are they? Subject. Yellow, of course. Dr. N. Oh, so all guides radiate yellow energy? Subject. No, they don't. Dr. N. What? Subject. Carla's teacher is Valère. He is blue. We see him sometimes here. Nice guy, very smart. Dr. N. Blue. How did we get to blue? Subject. Valère shows a light blue. Dr. N. I'm confused. You didn't say anything about another teacher called Valère being part of your group. Subject. You didn't ask me. Anyway, he is not in my group. Neither is Carla. They have their own groups. Dr. N. And these guides have auras which are yellow and blue? Subject. Yes. Dr. N. How many other energy colors do you see floating around here? Subject. None. Dr. N. Why not red and green energy lights? Subject. Some are reddish, but no green lights. Dr. N. Why not? Subject. I don't know, but sometimes when I look around... This place is lit up like a Christmas tree. Dr. N. I'm curious about Valère. Does every spiritual group have two teachers assigned to their cluster? Subject. Hmm. It varies. Carla trains under Valère, so we have two. We see little of him. He works with other groups besides us. Dr. N. So, Carla herself is student teaching as a less advanced guide? Subject, somewhat indignantly. 
She is advanced enough for me. Dr. N. Okay, but will you help me straighten out these color schemes? Why is Carla's energy radiating yellow and Valair blue? Subject. It's easy. Valair precedes all of us in knowledge, and he gives off a darker intensity of light. Dr. N. Does the shade of blue, compared to yellow or plain white, make a difference between souls? Subject. I'm trying to tell you. Blue is deeper than yellow, and yellow is more intense than white, depending on how far along you are. Dr. N. Oh, then the luminosity of Valair radiates less brightly than Carla, and she is less brilliant than your energy because you are further down in development? Subject laughs, much further down. They both have a heavier, more steady life than me. Dr. N. And how does Carla's yellow color vary from your whiteness in terms of where you are going with your own advancement? Subject, with pride. I'm turning into a reddish white. Eventually I'll have light gold. Recently I've noticed Carla turning a little darker yellow. I expected it. She is so knowledgeable and good. Dr. N. Really? And then will she eventually take her energy level to dark blue in intensity? Subject. No, to a light blue at first. It's always gradual, as our energy becomes more dense. Dr. N. So these three basic lights of white, yellow, and blue represent the development stages of souls and are visibly obvious to all spirits? Subject. That's right. And the changes are very slow. Dr. N. Look around again. Do you see all the energy colors equally represented by souls in this area? Subject. Oh, no, mostly white, some yellows, and few blues. Dr. N. Thank you for clarifying this for me. I routinely question everyone about their color hues while they are in trance. Aside from the general whiteness of the spirit world itself, my subjects report seeing a majority of other souls displaying shades of white. Apparently, a neutral white or gray is the starting point of development. Spirit auras then mix the primary colors of red, yellow, and blue from a base of white. A few people see greenish hues mixed with yellow or blue. To equate what I have heard about soul energy with the physical laws which govern the color spectrum we see in the heavens is just supposition. However, I have found some similarities. The energy of radiated light from cooler stars in the sky is a red-orange, while the hotter stars increase from yellow to blue-white. Temperature acts on light waves that are also visible vibrations of the spectrum with different frequencies. The human eye registers these waves as a band of light to dark colors. The energy colors of souls probably have little to do with such elements as hydrogen and helium, but perhaps there is an association with a high energy field of electromagnetism. I suspect all soul light is influenced by vibrational motion, in tune with a harmonious spiritual oneness of wisdom. Some aspects of quantum physics suggest the universe is made up of vibrational waves which influence masses of physical objects by an interaction of different frequencies. Light, motion, sound, and time are all interrelated in physical space. I was hearing these same relationships applied to spiritual matter from my cases. Eventually, I concluded both our spiritual and physical consciousness project and receive light energy. I believe individual vibrational wave patterns represent each soul's aura. As souls, the density, color, and form of light we radiate is proportional to the power of our knowledge and perception, as represented by increasing concentrations of light matter as we develop. Individual patterns of energy not only display who we are, but indicate the degree of ability to heal others and regenerate ourselves. People in hypnosis speak of colors to describe how souls appear, especially from a distance when they are shapeless. For my cases, I have learned the more advanced souls project masses of faster-moving energy particles, which are reported to be blue in color, 
with the highest concentrations being purple. In the visible spectrum on Earth, blue-violet has the shortest wavelength, with energy peaking in the invisible ultraviolet. If color density is a reflection of wisdom, then the lower wavelengths of white through yellow emanating from souls must represent lower concentrations of vibrational energy. The classification of souls by color coding, as reported by my subjects, can be represented by a chart I have designed. The left column lists the soul's spiritual state, or grade level of learning. The right column shows our guide status and denotes our ability and readiness to serve in that capacity for others, which will be explained further in the next chapter. Learning begins with our creation as a soul, and then accelerates with the first physical life assignment. With each incarnation we grow in understanding, although we may slip back in certain lives before regaining our footing and advancing again. Nevertheless, from what I can determine, once a spiritual level is attained by the soul, it stays there. This chart includes six levels of incarnating souls. Although I generally place my subjects into the broad categories of beginner, intermediate, and advanced souls, there are subtle differences in between at levels two and four. For example, to determine whether a soul is starting to move out of the beginner stage at level one into level two, I must not only know how much white energy remains, but analyze the subject's responses to questions which demonstrate learning. A genealogy of past life successes, future expectations, group associations, and conversations between my subjects and their guides all form a profile of growth. The contents of the chart are as follows. Learning stage, level one, beginner. Kinetic color range, white, bright and homogeneous. Guide status, none. Learning stage, level two, lower intermediate. Kinetic color range, off-white, reddish shades ultimately turning into traces of yellow. Guide status, none. Learning stage, level three, intermediate. Kinetic color range, yellow, solid with no traces of white. Guide status, none. Learning stage, level four, upper intermediate. Kinetic color range, dark yellow, a deep gold ultimately turning into traces of blue. Guide status, junior. Learning stage, level five, advanced. Kinetic color range, light blue, with no traces of yellow, ultimately turning into traces of purple. Guide status, senior. Learning stage, level six, highly advanced. Kinetic color range, dark bluish purple, surrounded by radiant light. Guide status, master. Some of my subjects object to my characterizing the spirit world as a place governed by societal structure and organizational management. On the other hand, I continually listen to these same subjects describe a planned and ordered process of self-development influenced by peers and teachers. If the spirit world does resemble one great schoolhouse with a multitude of classrooms under the direction of teacher souls who monitor our progress, then it has structure. My chart represents a basic working placement model for my own use. I know it has imperfections. I hope follow-up research by regression therapists in future years may build upon my conceptualizations with their own replications to measure soul maturity. This chapter may give the reader the impression that souls are as segregated by light level in the spirit world as people are by class and communities on earth. Societal conditions on earth cannot be compared with the spirit world. The differences in light frequency measuring knowledge in souls all comes from the same energy source. Souls are fully integrated by thought. If all levels of performance in the spirit world were on one grade level, souls would have a poor system of training. The old one-room schoolhouse concept of education on earth limited students of different ages. In spiritual peer groups, Souls work at their own developmental level with others like them. Mature teacher guides prepare succeeding generations of souls to take their places. And so there are practical reasons why conditions exist in the spirit world 
for a system designed to measure learning and development. The system fosters enlightenment and ultimately the perfection of souls. It is important to understand that while we may suffer the consequences of bad choices in our educational tasks, we are always protected, supported, and directed within the system by master souls. I see this as the spiritual management of souls. The whole idea of a hierarchy of souls has been part of both Eastern and Western cultures for many centuries. Plato spoke of the transformation of souls from childhood to adulthood, passing through many stages of moral reason. The Greeks felt humankind moves from amoral, immature, and violent beings over many lives to people who are finally socialized with pity, patience, forgiveness, honesty, and love. In the second century A.D., the new Christian theology was greatly influenced by Plotinus, whose Neoplatonist cosmology involved souls having a hierarchy of degrees of being. The highest being was a transcendent one, or God-creator, out of which the soul self was born which would occupy humans. Eventually these lower souls would return to complete reunion with the universal oversoul. My classification of soul development is intended to be neither socially nor intellectually elitist. Souls in a high state of advancement are often found in humble circumstances on earth. By the same token, people in the upper strata of influence in human society are by no means in a blissful state of soul maturity. Often just the reverse is true. In terms of placement by soul development, I cannot overemphasize the importance of our spiritual groups. Chapter 9 on Beginner Souls, Levels 1 and 2, will more closely examine how a soul group functions. Before going further, however, I want to summarize what I have learned about the basic principles of soul group assignments. Regardless of the relative time of creation after their novice status is completed, all beginner souls are assigned to a new group of souls at their level of understanding. Once a new soul support group is formed, no new members are added in the future. There appears to be a systematic selection procedure for homogeneous groupings of souls. Similarities of ego, cognitive awareness, expression, and desire are all considerations. Irrespective of size, cluster groups do not directly intermix with each other's energy but souls can communicate with one another across primary and secondary group boundaries. Primary clusters in levels 1 and 2 may split into smaller subgroups for study, but are not separated from the integrated whole within a single cluster of souls. Rates of learning vary among peer group members. Certain souls will advance faster than others in a cluster group, although these students may not be equally competent and effective in all areas of their curricula. Around the intermediate level of learning, souls demonstrating special talents, healing, teaching, creating, etc., are permitted to participate in specialty groups for more advanced work, while still remaining with their cluster group. At the point where a soul's needs, motives, and performance abilities are judged to be fully at level three in all areas of self-development, they are then loosely formed into an independent studies work group. Usually, their old guides continue to monitor them through one master teacher. Thus, a new pod of entities graduating into full level three could be brought together from many clusters within one or more secondary groups. When they approach level four, souls are given more independence outside group activities. Although group size diminishes as souls advance, the intimate contact between original peer group members is never lost. Spirit guides have a wide variety of teaching methods and instructional personifications, depending upon group composition. 8. Our Guides I have never worked with a subject in trance who did not have a personal guide. Some guides are more in evidence than others during hypnosis sessions. It is my custom to ask subjects if they see or feel a discarnate presence in the room. If they do, this third party is usually a protective guide. Often, 
A client will sense the presence of a discarnate figure before visualizing a face or hearing a voice. People who meditate a great deal are naturally more familiar with these visions than someone who has never called upon his or her guide. The recognition of these spiritual teachers brings people into the company of a warm, loving, creative power. Through our guides, we become more acutely aware of the continuity of life and our identity as a soul. Guides are figures of grace in our existence because they are part of the fulfillment of our destiny. Guides are complex entities, especially when they are master guides. The awareness level of the soul determines to some extent the degree of advancement of the guide assigned to them. In fact, the maturity of a particular guide also has a bearing on whether these teachers have only one student or many under their direction. Guides at the senior level of ability and above usually work with an entire group of souls in the spirit world and on earth. These guides have other entities who assist them. From what I can see, every soul group usually has one or more rather new teachers in training. As a result, some people may have more than one guide helping them. The personal names my clients attach to their guides range from ordinary, whimsical, or quaint-sounding words to the bizarre. Frequently, these names can be traced back to a specific past life a teacher spent with a student. Some clients are unable to verbalize their guide's name because the sound cannot be duplicated, even when they see them clearly while under hypnosis. I tell these people it is much more important that they understand the purpose of why certain guides are assigned to them, rather than possessing their names. A subject may simply use a general designation for their guide, such as director, advisor, instructor, or just my friend. One has to be careful how the word friend is interpreted. Usually, when a person in trance talks about a spiritual friend, they are referring to a soulmate or peer group associate rather than a guide. Entities who are our friends exist on levels not much higher or lower than ourselves. These friends are able to offer mental encouragement from the spirit world while we are on earth, and they can be with us as incarnated human companions while we walk the roads of life. One of the most important aspects of my therapeutic work with clients is assisting them on a conscious level with appreciating the role their guides play in life. These teacher entities edify all of us with their skillful instruction techniques. Ideas we claim as our own may be generated by a concerned guide. Guides also comfort us during the trying periods in our lives, especially when we are children in need of solace. I remember a charming remark made by a subject after I asked when she began seeing her guide in this life. Oh, when I was daydreaming, she said. I remember my guide was with me on my first day of school when I was really scared. She sat on top of my desk to keep me company, and then showed me the way to the bathroom when I was too afraid to ask the teacher. The concept of personalized spiritual beings goes far back in antiquity to our earliest origins as thinking human beings. Anthropological studies at the sites of prehistoric people suggest their totemic symbols evoked individual protection. Later, some 5,000 years ago as city-states arose, Official deities became identified with state religions. These gods were more remote and even generated fear. Thus, personal and family deities assumed great importance in the day-to-day -day life of people for protection. A personal soul deity served as a guardian angel to each person or family and could be called upon for divine help during a crisis. This tradition has been carried down into our cultures of today. We have two examples at opposite ends of the United States. Aumakua is a personal god to Hawaiians. The Polynesians believe one's ancestors can assume a personal god relationship, as humans, animals, or fish, to living family members. In visions and dreams, Aumakua can either assist or reprimand an individual. In northeastern America, the Iroquois believe a human's own inner spiritual power is called Orenda, which is connected to a higher personal Orenda spirit. This guardian is able to resist the powers of harm and evil directed at an individual. The concept of soul watchers, who function as guides, is part of the belief system of many Native American cultures. 
The Zuni tribes of the Southwest have oral traditions in their mythology of godlike beings with personal existences. They are called the makers and holders of life paths and are considered the caretakers of souls. There are other cultures around the world which also believe someone other than God is watching over them to personally intercede on their behalf. I think human beings have always needed anthropomorphic figures below a supreme God to portray the spiritual forces around them. When people pray or meditate, they want to reach out to an entity with whom they are acquainted for inspiration. It is easier to ask for aid from a figure which can be clearly identified in the human mind. There is a lack of imagery with a supreme God which hinders a direct connection for many people. Regardless of our diverse religious preferences and degrees of faith, people also feel if there is a supreme God, this divinity is too busy to bother about their individual problems. People often express an unworthiness for a direct association with God. As a result, the world's major religions have used prophets who once lived on earth to serve as our intermediaries with God. Possibly because some of these prophets have been elevated to divine status themselves, they are not personal enough anymore. I say this without diminishing the vital spiritual influence all the great prophets have had on their followers. Millions of people derive benefit from the teachings of these powerful souls who incarnated on earth as prophets in our historical past. And yet, people know in their hearts, as they have always known, that someone, some personal entity individual to them is there waiting to be reached. I have the theory that guides appear to people who are very religious as figures of their faith. There was a case on a national television show where the child of a devout Christian family suffered a near-death experience and said she saw Jesus. When asked to draw with crayons what she saw, the little girl drew a featureless blue man standing within a halo of light. My subjects have shown me how much they depend upon and make use of their spiritual guides during life. I have come to believe we are their direct responsibility, not God's. These learned teachers remain with us over thousands of earth years to assist in our trials, before, during, and after countless lives. I notice that, unlike people walking around in a conscious state, subjects in trance do not blame God for their misfortunes in life. More often than not, when we are in the soul state, it is our personal guide who takes the brunt of any dissatisfaction. I am often asked if teacher guides are matched to us or just picked at random. This is a difficult question to answer. Guides do appear to be assigned to us in the spirit world in an orderly fashion. I have come to believe their individual teaching styles and management techniques support and beautifully integrate with our permanent soul identity. For instance, I have heard about younger guides whose past lives included overcoming particularly difficult negative traits, being assigned to souls with the same behavior patterns. It seems these empathetic guides are graded on how well they do in their assignments to affect positive change. All guides have compassion for their students, but teaching approaches vary. I find some guides constantly helping their students on earth, while others demand their charges work out lessons with little overt encouragement. The maturity of the soul is, of course, a factor. Certainly graduate students get less help than freshmen. Aside from the developmental level, I look at the intensity of individual desire as another consideration in the frequency of appearance and form of assistance one receives from his or her guide during a life. As to gender assignments, I find no consistent correlation of male and female subjects to masculine or feminine appearing guides. On the whole, people accept the gender portrayed by their guide as quite natural. It could be argued that this is because they have become used to them over eons of relative time, as males or females, rather than the assumption that one sex is more effective than another between specific students and teachers. Some guides appear as mixed genders, which lends support to souls being truly androgynous. One client told me, My guide is sometimes Alexis or Alex, dropping in and out of both sexes, depending on my need for male or female advice. From what I can determine, 
The procedure for teacher selection is carefully managed in the spirit world. Every human being has at least one senior or a higher master guide assigned to their soul since the soul was first created. Many of us inherit a newer secondary guide later in our existence, such as Carla in the previous chapter. For want of a better term, I have called these student teachers junior guides. Aspiring junior guides can anticipate the beginning of their training near the end of level three as they progress into the upper intermediate stages of development. Actually, we begin our training as subordinate guides long before attaining level four. In the lower stages of development, we help others in life as friends and between lives assist our peer group associates with counseling. Junior and senior teaching assignments appear to reflect the will of master guides who form a kind of governing body, similar to a trusteeship over the younger guides of the spirit world. We will see examples of how the process of guide development works in chapters 10 and 11, which cover cases of more advanced souls. Do all guides have the same teaching abilities? And does this affect the size of the group to which we are assigned in the spirit world? The following passage is from the case file of an experienced soul who discussed this question with me. Case 17 Dr. N. I'm curious about teacher assignments in the spirit world in relation to their abilities to help undeveloped souls. When souls progress as guides, are they given quite a few souls to work with? Subject. Only the more practiced ones. Dr. N. I would imagine a large group of souls needing guides could become quite a responsibility for one advanced guide, even with an assistant. Subject. They can handle it. Size doesn't matter. Dr. N. Why not? Subject. Once you attain competency and success as a teacher, the number of souls you are given doesn't matter. Some sections, clusters, have lots of souls and others don't. Dr. N. So if you are a senior in the blue light aura, class size has no relation to assignments because you have the ability to handle large numbers of souls? Subject. I didn't exactly say that. Much depends upon the types of souls in a section and the experience of the leaders. In the larger sections, they have helped too, you know. Dr. N. Who does? Subject. The guides you are calling seniors. Dr. N. Well, who helps them? Subject. The overseers. Now they are the real pros. Dr. N. I have heard them also called master teachers. Subject. That's not a bad description for them. Dr. N. What energy color do they project to you? Subject. It's purplish. Note. The lower ranges of a five level radiate a sky blue energy. With advancing maturity, this aura grows more dense, first to a muted midnight blue, and finally to deep purple, representing the total integration of a level six ascended master. Dr. N. Since guides seem to have different approaches to teaching, what do they all have in common? Subject. They wouldn't be teachers if they didn't have a love of training and a desire to help us join them. Dr. N. Then define for me why souls are selected as guides. Take a typical guide and tell me what qualities that advanced soul possesses. Subject. They must be compassionate without being too easy on you. They aren't judgmental. You don't have to do things their way. They don't restrain by imposing their values on you. Dr. N. Okay, those are things guides don't do. If they don't overdirect souls, what are the important things they do, as you see it? Subject. Ah, uh, they build morale in their sections and instill confidence. We all know they have been through a lot themselves. We are accepted for who we are as individuals with the right to make our own mistakes. Dr. N. I must say I have found souls very loyal to their guides. Subject. That's why, because they never give up on you. Dr. N. What would you say is the most important attribute of any guide? Subject. Without hesitation. The ability to motivate you and instill courage. My next case provides an example of the actions of a still-incarnating guide. 
This guide is called Owa, and he represents the qualities of a devoted teacher reported by the last case. Evidently, his early assignments as a guide involved looking after the subject in case 18 in a direct fashion, and his methods apparently have not changed. My client was stunned once she recognized her guide's latest incarnation. Owa made his first appearance as a guide in my client's past, about 50 B.C. He was described as an old man living in a Judean village, which had been overrun by Roman soldiers. Case 18 was then a young girl, orphaned by a Roman raid against local dissidents. In the opening scene of this past life, she spoke about working in a tavern as a virtual slave. As a serving girl, she was constantly beaten by the owner and occasionally raped by Roman customers. She died at age 26 of overwork, mistreatment, and despair. This subject made the following statement from her subconscious mind about an old man in her village. I worked day and night and felt numb with pain and humiliation. He was the only person who was kind to me, who taught me to trust in myself to have faith in something higher and finer than the cruel people around me. Later, in the superconscious state, this client detailed parts of other difficult lives where Oa appeared as a trusted friend, and once as a brother. In this state, she saw these people were all the same entity, and was able to name this soul as Oa, her guide. There were many lives when Oa did not appear, and sometimes his physical contact was only fleeting when he came to help her. Abruptly, I asked if Oa might possibly be in her life now. After a moment of hesitation, my subject began to shake uncontrollably. Tears came to her eyes and she cried out from the vision in her mind. Case 18 Subject Oh, Lord, I knew it. I knew there was something different about him. Dr. N. About who? Subject. My son. Oa is my son Brandon. Dr. N. Your son is actually Oa? Subject. Yes, yes. Laughing and crying at the same time. I knew it. I felt it right from the day I delivered him. Something wonderfully familiar and special to me. More than just a helpless baby. Oh... Dr. N., what did you know the day he was born? Subject, I didn't really know. I felt it inside. Something more than the excitement a mother feels at the time of her firstborn. I felt he came here to help me. Don't you see? Oh, it's so fantastic. It's true. It's him. Dr. N., I work on calming my client before continuing because her excited wiggling around is about to carry her over the side of the office recliner. Why do you think Oa is here as your baby son, Brandon? Subject. Quieter now, but still crying softly. To get me through this bad time, with hard people who won't accept me. He must have known I was in for a long period of trouble and decided to come to me as my son. We didn't talk about doing this before I was born. What a wonderful surprise. Note. At the time of this session, my client was struggling to gain recognition in a highly competitive business. She was also having marital difficulties at home, partly due to being the major wage earner. I have since learned she is divorced. Dr. N. Did you sense something unusual about your baby after you took him home? Subject. Yes. It started at the hospital, and this feeling never left me. When I look into his eyes, he soothes me. Sometimes I come home so worn out, so tired and beat down. I am sure tempered with him when the babysitter leaves, but he is so patient with me. I don't even need to hold him. The way he looks at me is so wise. I didn't fully understand what this meant until now. Now I know. Oh, what a blessing. I wasn't sure if I should even have the baby. Now I see it all. Dr. N., what do you see? Subject, in a firm voice. As I try to advance in my profession, people are getting harder. 
not accepting what I know and can do. My husband and I are having trouble. He puts me down for pushing too hard, wanting to achieve. Oh, uh, Brandon is here to keep me strong so I can overcome. Dr. N, and do you think it is all right we discovered your guide is with you as Brandon in this life? Subject, yes. If Owa didn't want me to know that he decided to come into my life, I wouldn't have come to see you. It wouldn't have been on my mind. This exceptional case represents the emotional intoxication a subject feels when an in-life contact is made with their guide. Notice the role Owa chose did not infringe upon the most typical role usually taken by a soulmate. He did not come through as her spouse and never has in any of her past lives. Certainly soulmates take other roles besides spouses, but an incarnating guide does not normally take on a role which might transgress between two soulmates working on their lives together. This client's soulmate happens to be an old flame from high school. Based upon all the information I was able to gather, Owa seems to have moved into the level of a junior guide in the last 2,000 years. He may possibly graduate into the blue level of a senior guide before this client has qualified herself to rise from white to a yellow energy aura. Regardless of the number of centuries this takes, Owa will remain as her guide, even though he may never incarnate again with her in a life. Do we ever catch up to our guides in development? Eventually, perhaps, but I can say I have not seen any evidence of this in my cases. Souls who develop relatively fast are gifted, but so are the guides who assist them. It is not uncommon to find guides working in pairs with people on earth, each with their own approaches to teaching. In these cases, one is dominant, although the more experienced senior guide may actually be less evident in day-to-day -day activities of their charges. The reason for this spiritual arrangement in tandem is because one of the pair is either in training, such as a junior guide under a senior, or the association is so long-standing between the two guides, as with a senior to a master, that a permanent relationship has evolved. The senior guide may have acquired his or her own cluster of souls, which is still monitored by a master overseeing a number of soul groups. Teams of guides do not interfere with each other in or out of the spirit world. I have a close friend whose guides illustrate how two teachers working together complement each other. Using this individual's case is appropriate because I have observed the way this person's two guides interact in various life circumstances. My friend's junior guide appears in the form of a kindly, nurturing Native American medicine woman called Kwan. Dressed simply in a deerskin sheath, her long hair pulled back, Kwan's soft face is bathed in vivid light during her appearances. When she is called, Kwan provides a vehicle for insight and understanding events and the individuals associated with those events, which are troubling to my friend. Kwan's desire to lighten the load of the rather difficult life my friend has chosen is tempered by a challenging male figure called Giles. Giles is clearly a senior guide who may be close to being a master in the spirit world. In this capacity, he does not appear nearly as often as Kwan. When Giles does come into my friend's higher consciousness, he does so abruptly. Here is a sample of how a senior guide operates differently from one of junior status. Case 19 Dr. N When you are in deep reflection over a serious problem, how does Giles come to you? Subject Laughs Not the same as Quan, I can tell you. Usually he likes to hide a little at first, behind a shadow of blue vapor. I hear him chuckling before I see him. Dr. N. You mean he appears first as a blue energy form? Subject. Yes, to hide himself a bit. He likes to be secretive, but it doesn't last long. Dr. N. Why? Subject. I don't know. To make sure I really want him, I guess. Dr. N. Well, when he shows himself, what does Giles look like to you? Subject. An Irish leprechaun. Dr. N. 
Oh, then he is a small man. Subject laughs again. An elf figure. Tangled hair all over his wrinkled face. He looks a mess and moves constantly in all directions. Dr. N. Why does he do that? Subject. Giles is a slippery character. Impatient, too. He frowns a lot while he paces back and forth in front of me, with his arms clasped in back of him. Dr. N. And how would you interpret this behavior? Subject. Giles is not dignified like some guys, but he is very clever, crafty. Dr. N. Could you be more specific as to how this conduct relates to you? Subject. Strained. Giles has made me look upon my lives as a chess game with the earth as the board. Certain moves bring certain results, and there are no easy solutions. I plan, and then things go wrong during the game in my life. I sometimes think he lays traps for me to work through on the board. Dr. N., do you prosper with this technique of your advanced guide? Has Giles been a help to your problem-solving during the game of life? Subject. Pause. More afterward. Here. In the spirit world. But he makes me work so damn hard on Earth. Dr. N. Could you get rid of him and just work with Quan? Subject. Smiles ruefully. It doesn't work that way here. Besides, he is brilliant. Dr. N. So we don't get to choose our guides? Subject. No way. They choose you. Dr. N. Do you have any idea why you have two guides who approach your problems so differently in the way they help you? Subject. No, I don't, but I consider myself very fortunate. Quan is gentle and steady with her support. Note. The embodiments of Native Americans who once lived in North America make powerful spiritual guides for those of us who have followed them to live in this land. The larger number of Americans who report having such guides lend support to my belief that souls are attracted to geographical settings that they have known during earlier incarnations. Dr. N. What do you like most about Guile's teaching methods? Subject, pensively. No, mm, oh, the way he, well, trifles with me, almost mocking me to do better during the game and stop feeling sorry for myself. When things get especially rough, he prods me and keeps me going, insisting I use all my abilities. There is nothing soft about Giles. Dr. N., and you feel this coaching on Earth, even when you and I are not working together? Subject, yes, when I meditate and go inside myself, or during my dreams. Dr. N., and Giles comes when you want him? Subject, after some hesitation. No, although it seems as though I have been with him forever. Quan does come to me more. I can't just grab hold of Giles in any situation I want, unless what I have going on is really serious. He is elusive. Dr. N., sum up your feelings about Quan and Giles for me. Subject. I love Quan as a mother, but I wouldn't be where I am without Giles' discipline. They are both skillful because they allow me to benefit from my mistakes. These two guides are a cooperating team of instructors, which is standard procedure for those people who have two guides. In this case, Giles enjoys teaching karmic lessons by the Socratic method. Providing no clues in advance, he makes sure problem-solving on major issues is never easy for my friend. Quan, on the other hand, provides comfort and gentle encouragement. When my friend comes to me for a hypnosis session, I am aware that Quan remains in the background when Giles is on board and active. Giles is a caring guide, as all guides are, but without a trace of indulgence. Adversity is allowed to build to the absolute limits of my friend's ability to cope before solutions suddenly begin to unfold. To be honest, I see Giles as a wicked taskmaster. This view is not really shared by my friend, who is grateful for the challenges offered by this complex teacher. What is the average spiritual guide like? In my experience, no two guides are the same. 
These dedicated higher entities give me the impression of having attitudinal swings toward me from one session to the next, and even within the same session with a client. They can be cooperative or obstructive, tolerant or disobliging, evasive or revealing, or just flat-out unconcerned with anything I do with a subject. I have great respect for guides, because these powerful figures play such an important part in our destiny, but I must admit they can frustrate my inquiries. I find them enigmatic, because they are unpredictable in their relations with me as a facilitator. Early in this century, it was common for mediums working with people in hypnosis to call any discarnate entity in the room a control, because they acted as the director of communications on the spiritual side for the subject. It was recognized that a spiritual control, whether a guide or not, had energy patterns which were in emotional, intellectual, and spiritual attunement with the subject. The importance of a harmonious energy pattern between facilitator and these entities was also known. If a control is blocking my investigations with a client, I search for the reason why this is happening. With some blocking guides, I must fight for every scrap of information while others give me a great deal of latitude in a session. I never forget that guides have every right to block my approach to problems with souls under their care. After all, I have their people as my subjects for only a short while. Frankly, I would much rather have no contact with a client's guide than work with one who might assist me at one point and then block the rhythm of memory in the next portion of a session. I believe a guide's motivation for blocking information goes far beyond resisting the immediate psychological direction a therapy session is taking. I am constantly searching for new data on the spirit world. A guide who lends support to a free flow of past life memories from one of my subjects may balk at my far-reaching questions about life on other planets, the structure of the spirit world, or creation itself. This is why I am only able to collect these spiritual secrets in fragments from a large body of client information reflecting the discretion of many guides. I also feel that I am receiving assistance from my own spiritual guide during communications with subjects and their guides. Occasionally, a subject will express dissatisfaction with his or her particular guide. This is usually temporary. At any time, people are capable of believing their guides are too difficult and not working in their best interests, or just not paying enough attention to them. A subject once told me that he had tried for a long time to be assigned another guide. He said, My guide is stonewalling me. She doesn't give enough of herself. The man told me his desire for a change in guides was not honored. I observed that he spent considerable time alone, without much group interaction after his last two lives, because he refused to deal with his issues. He projected anger toward his guide for not rescuing him from bad situations. Our teachers really don't get perturbed with us to the point of alienation, but I notice they have a way of making themselves scarce when disgruntled students avoid real problem-solving. Guides only want the best for us, and sometimes this means they must watch us endure much pain to reach certain objectives. Guides cannot assist in our progress, until we are ready to make the necessary changes in order to take full advantage of life's opportunities. Do we have a reason to be fearful of our guides? In Chapter 5, with Case 13, we saw an obviously younger soul who expressed some trepidation right after death about meeting the guide Clodies for debriefing. Typically, this concern does not last. We may feel chagrined over having to explain to our guides why goals were not attained, but they understand. They want us to interpret our past lives so we will have the benefit of assisting in the analysis of mistakes. My clients express all sorts of sentiments about their guides, but fear is not among them. On the contrary, people are more worried about being abandoned by spiritual advisors during difficult periods in their lives. Our relationship with guides is one of students and teachers rather than defendants and judges. Our personal guides help us cope with the separateness and isolation which every soul inherits at physical birth, regardless of the degree of love extended by our family. Guides give us an affirmation of self in a crowded world. People want to know if their guides always come whenever they call for help. Guides are not consistent in the manner in which they choose to assist us, 
because they carefully evaluate how badly they are needed. I am also asked if hypnosis is the best way to get in contact with one's guide. Naturally, I lean toward hypnosis, because I know how potent and effective this medium can be to obtain detailed spiritual information. However, hypnosis by a trained facilitator is not convenient on a daily basis, where meditation, prayer, and perhaps channeling with another person would be. Self-hypnosis as a form of deep meditation is an excellent alternative and may be preferred by those who have a fear of being hypnotized by others or don't want the interference of a second party in their spiritual life. Regardless of the method used, we all have the capacity to send out far-reaching thought waves from our higher consciousness. Every person's thoughts represent a mental fingerprint to guides marking who and where we are. During our lives, especially in periods of great stress, most people feel the presence of someone watching out for them. We may not be able to describe this power, but it is there nonetheless. Reaching our soul is the first step on the ladder of finding our higher power. All lines of mental communication we use to reach a Godhead are monitored by our guides on this step. They too have their guides further up the ladder. The entire ladder serves as one unbroken conduit to the source of all intelligent energy, with each rung being part of the whole. It is essential for people to have faith that a prayer for help will be answered by their own higher power. This is why guides are vitally important to our spiritual and temporal lives. If we are relaxed and in a state of concentrated focus, an inner voice speaks to us. And even if we didn't initiate the message, we should trust what we hear. National surveys by psychologists indicate one person in ten admits to hearing voices which are frequently positive and instructional in nature. It is a relief for many people to learn their inner voices are not hallucinations associated with the mentally ill. Rather than something to be worried about, an inner voice is like having your own resident counselor on call. More often than not, these voices are those of our guides. Guides assigned to different souls do work together relaying urgent mental messages for each other. People unable to help themselves in critical situations may find counselors, friends, and even strangers coming to their aid at just the right moment. The inner strength which comes to us in our daily lives does not arrive as much by a visual picture of actually seeing our guides as from the feelings and emotions which convince us we are not alone. People who listen and encourage their inner voice through quiet contemplation say they feel a personal connection with an energy beyond themselves, which offers support and reassurance. If you prefer to call this internal guidance system inspiration or intuition, that is fine, because the system which aids us is an aspect of ourselves as well as higher powers. During troublesome times in our lives, we have the tendency to ask for guidance to immediately set things right. When they are in trance, my clients see that their guides don't help them solve all their problems at once, Rather, they illuminate pathways by the use of clues. This is one reason why I am cautious about client blocking during hypnosis. Insight is best revealed with a controlled pace relative to each person. A concerned teacher may not want all aspects of a problem uncovered at a given point in time for his or her student. We vary in our ability to handle revelations. When asking for help from your higher spiritual power... I think it is best not to demand immediate change. Our success in life is predicated on planning, but we do have alternative paths to choose from to reach certain goals. When seeking guidance, I suggest requesting help with just the next step in your life. When you do this, be prepared for unexpected possibilities. Have the faith and humility to open yourself up to a variety of paths towards solutions. After death, we do not experience sadness as souls with the same emotional definition as grief felt in physical form. Yet, as we have already seen, souls are not detached beings without feelings. I have learned those powers who watch over us also feel what I call a spiritual sorrow when they see us making poor choices in life and going through pain. Certainly, our soulmates and peers suffer distress when we are tormented. 
but so do our guides. Guides may not show sorrow in orientation conferences and during soul group discussions between lives, but they keenly feel their responsibilities toward us as teachers. In Chapter 11, we will get the perspective of a guide at Level 5. I have never found a person who is a living Grade 6 or Master Guide as a subject. I suspect we don't have a whole lot of these advanced souls on Earth at any one time. Most Level 6s are much too involved with planning and directing from the spirit world to incarnate any longer. From the reports of the Level 5s I have had, it would seem the Level 6 has no new lessons to learn. But I have a hunch a still incarnating soul at Level 5 may not know all the esoteric tasks involved with Master Level entities. Once in a while, during a session with a more advanced soul, I hear references to an even higher level of soul than Level 6. These entities, to whom even the Masters report, are in the darkest purple range of energy. These superior beings must be getting close to the Creator. I am told these shadowy figures are elusive, but highly venerated beings in the spirit world. The average client doesn't know if spiritual guides should be placed in a less-than-divine category or considered lesser gods because of their advancement. There is nothing wrong with any spiritual concept, as long as it provides comfort, is uplifting, and makes sense to each individual. Although some of my clients have the tendency to consider guides godlike, they are not God. In my opinion, guides are no more or less divine than we are, which is why they are seen as personal beings. In all my cases, God is never seen. People in hypnosis say they feel the presence of a supreme power directing the spirit world, but they are uncomfortable using the word God to describe a creator. Perhaps the philosopher Spinoza said it best with these words, God is not he who is, but that which is. Every soul has a spiritual higher power linked to its existence. All souls are part of the same divine essence generated from one oversoul. This intelligent energy is universal in scope, and so we all share in divine status. If our soul reflects a small portion of the oversoul we call God, then our guides provide the mirror by which we are able to see ourselves connected to this Creator. This audiobook has been broken into multiple parts to make the download faster. You have reached the end of a part, but not the end of the complete audiobook. So please check your library for the next part of this audiobook. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.